Good evening. Uh, today on God is Open, we are going to be doing a post-debate review. Will Duffy, he just did it just an hour ago. I screen capped it, and now we can share that experience here. He went on the Tyler Fowler show, something like that, and uh, had a discussion of open theism. I was able to get into the channel, so I got my little uh, screen and screen capture going on right about there. And, but they do start shortly after I get in the channel. I kind of get in uh, partway through the opening statement by some unnamed, unvideoed guy. So we're just going to hit play on that. In Joseph's story, we see so much uh, with, uh, with respect to every other view out there. I don't think that you're seriously going to understand that every event in Joseph's story was just the unforeseen, uh, at least by God result of a myriadic free will decision. And this is not just a reform view, but uh, in any traditional uh, Protestant evangelical view, you would have to say that there was more there than just random free will decision. We could ask the Joseph's brothers that simply killed him. They certainly contemplated it rather than selling him into slavery. Or could Potiphar's wife have not tried to produce it? Uh, uh, and we have to ask ourselves, is these things happening? Is that what God has thought of plan B? Uh, and at what point did God uh, come to decide that he was going to do this with Joseph? Even though we know this is the descendant of Abraham that this was promised to. Because if, if, if he doesn't have uh, the knowledge of even three good decisions and then beforehand, I, I don't see how he could have known they would be alive. And if he did not know that Joseph would be alive, I submit to you that he's not gone at all. And I again, with respect, to sincerely ask. <clears throat> We're told, we're told so many times in Scripture to, that this God is worthy of glory and praise, and, and, and if he's just hoping for the best scenario or, or getting lucky, I don't see how he's God at all. And I certainly don't see that he, he would be praiseworthy uh, or that we would uh, have any reason to glorify. And I kind of just went over uh, what I had prepared there. Sure. Yeah. Mike, let me ask you this real quick. Are you on speakerphone, or are you... Um... We're, we're kind of having a hard time hearing you, brother. Um, it's it's really really scratchy. Um, are are you on like a Bluetooth headset or? Is this better? That is much better. That is much better. Well, I well, hate that I gave my whole speech. Uh, hope well, I, make out most of what I'm saying. Yeah, I kind of hate. I it didn't want to cut you off. Um, be because you were. Something I wasn't about Potiphar. A bit of something it. about Joseph. Um, but basically, the the points that I got was Genesis fifty explains that whenever we see evil or at least in this case whenever man intended evil god was working good through that right so yeah let's talk about that uh, so in genesis this is a famous passage used by calvinists like the first one in genesis so genesis is not a very calvinistic book so they have to like turn to the end chapters of genesis to try to find something in, in which they can make a positive case for determinism or for Calvinism. And so they come across this individual uh, named Joseph, who had a personal relationship with God to the extent that uh, Joseph, uh, one of his skill sets is interpreting dreams. Um, he seemed to be very close with God in a lot of respects. And so they turn to this passage about how God, God weaved, weaved is the word there, it's a good translation. God weaved together uh, what the, the brothers weaved for evil, God weaved for good. And then they say, look, this is how God acts on all things, everywhere, always. This is not really good evidence of anything of the sort. You know, it's it's going from specifics to generalities, not, not even just generalities. I, I mean, open theists probably should not, we shouldn't object when, when uh, the Calvinist says, yeah, God's intimately involved in our lives and and in in, uh, in small details and doing things, we we could all readily admit to that. Uh, but they want to take it so far as every single leaf that falls from every single tree is ordained and predestined and worked by God. That's that's not what this story is actually describing. It's describing God turning an evil event to a good event. God works all things together with us, as Paul writes. So it's an open theist concept. If God is working in real time with us to craft events, to get events to turn out how he wants, that's open theism. But since there's there's an evil act, and it uses the same word in relation to that act as with God, they claim, see, this is Calvinism. God is using evil for something, therefore, 
God does all evil everywhere for a specific purpose at all times. Not even that, but all things. Uh, there's a rock that falls to the bottom of the ocean. God's controlling that as well. It's a huge leap of logic. And again, uh, Will Duffy in this debate, he, he points out, um, he hasn't given his opening statement yet, but they don't have verses to support their conclusions. He, they want to talk if, if God knows all future events, instead they want to try to make a case for God has determinism of some events somewhere or all current events. It's their, their proof texts aren't on online with what they're trying to prove. And for, uh, for would, me, go ahead. I would just definitely say that it, it goes further than just because we can point to myriad examples in Scripture of where God brings something uh, from something else, something that maybe seems bad or, or something like that. But what's interesting here, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar by any means, but I've heard people that, that, are, that are very versed in Hebrew say that there's a sort of a parallel between the what you meant for evil, God meant for good. It's not just it's sort of on the surface level, we don't really get the full effect in English, mm -hmm. that there's actual a positive intent on God's part for it. But even in the English, that's made manifest, uh, manifestly clear in that he gives us the purpose that he intended it for. And again, in the short term, that's to save many people alive. But like I said, I wish we just had more time to go into all that that meant later, uh, just that mm -hmm. one man's life and, and what happened to him, what it meant, that basically set the stage for everything else that happened in the Old and New Testament. Right, right. And then you said, um, I think, and correct me if this is wrong, but you said, why should we glorify uh, a God that is, you know, that doesn't know the future, that isn't working a specific plan that he has, you know, he's decreed from the very beginning, right? And so... So notice that emotional type argument going on here. It's like, if open theism is true, that'd make me very sad, and I wouldn't want to worship that God why don't you tell me why I should worship that God? Well, first of all, we need to establish if that God is the real God, if that God is the God that the Bible depicts, and then we could deal with your fragile emotions. That's the second step. Uh, your tears don't have any effect on the truth value of the world around us. Your tears don't have any effect on the truth value of what does the Bible teach about God. Yeah, you go ahead and emote a yeah, secondary. There we go. Uh, this John McGaffey didn't kill himself. 100% true. Your question was, why should we glorify this God? Why is he worthy of worship, right? I want to get, I want to go ahead and transition uh, to Will. And Will, um, sorry, again, my apologies about uh, Mike's audio there, but I think we're on track now. But Will, if you would like to go ahead and respond to what Mike has said, um, take your time in. And again, like I said, in your, in the text, I'll give you a little bit more time uh, than five to seven minutes to really explain what is open theism from somebody who's never heard of this before. Yeah, absolutely. So here's uh, open Duffy. theism is essentially the theology that the uh, future is open and not settled. And foundationally, the reason I believe in open theism is because of free will. And what's interesting is when we say free will, most people assume that we're talking about men, but my position is actually based on God's free will. So I believe that the future is open because God himself has free will. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm an open theist because I believe that this is what the Bible teaches from cover to cover. So I believe that this is the most consistent biblical theology. So I, I like the fact that he starts by framing this as a discussion about who God is. Does God have free will? He doesn't he doesn't bring us about back to this point in 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 the in the course of this conversation with these individuals, but that would have been something to bring us back to. This is about who God is, what God can do. Can God change his mind about the future? And all their proof texts is, look at this. Here's a text where God does something. Oh, here's a text where God knows something about, about a kid in the womb. It's, it's, it really is pulling it away from who God is, fundamentally his character. It's, it, it doesn't turn into a debate about whether God can know something new, well, whether God can do something new, according to the Bible. But that could have been uh, a potent point to bring it back around to. I'm not criticizing Will Duffy 
not bring us back there because he does a pretty good job in this debate pointing out and re-emphasizing the fact that they have zero proof text. They have zero verses despite what they claim. None of their verses say what they claim that those verses say. On God and his knowledge. And uh, open theists don't have to take random, obscure verses uh, from places in the Old Testament or wherever. Um, I created a list of open theism verses when I was preparing for my debate with Matt Slick of Karm.org. That list has grown to almost 600 verses. Mm -hmm. And we actually see open theism through all of the main stories in the Bible that everyone's familiar with. So yeah. we could look at the creation to see open theism, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Abraham and Isaac, Moses and the Exodus. So uh, what I don't like about this part right here, when... When Will Duffy is giving an overview of the Bible, the plot of the Bible, how we see open theism in all these stories, he just lists out the stories. He doesn't actually give the, the brief clip about what's open theistic in, in that story. So maybe in creation, God brings the animals to Adam so that he sees what Adam's going to call them. How about in the flood where God looks down and sees the earth has become wicked and changes his mind about having created the world? Uh, Exodus, where, where God wants to destroy all of Israel, but Moses convinces God not to destroy Israel. Why? Because God's public image would be affected. And that's the reason why. Or how about even when God is commissioning Moses to go speak to him, to Pharaoh? And guess what Moses does? He, he complains and he says, oh, I can't do it. And God gets mad and attempts to convince him. And um, that, that falls through. And then Aaron is appointed as the individual to do the speaking. You know, we see these things throughout the Bible. So if you're giving the plot overview of the Bible, add those details because that would really flag in the audience's mind. The audience is not not necessarily going to know what you're talking about by listing out those events unless you, you give the potent point along with the event in your overview of the Bible. And it'll be just that more potent rather than just listing the events. Um, Israel's relationship with God throughout the Old Testament. Uh, the potter and the clay, uh, Jonah and, and Nineveh. In the New Testament, we can look at the incarnation. We can look at the ascension, the life of Christ. All of these uh, show open theism. And so when we look at the Bible as a whole, I'm going to make a couple of observations here that I think are pretty significant. Um, the first is, uh, it appears that the Bible is completely absent of verses stating first that God is outside of time. Yeah. So other terminology could be used as timeless or in an eternal now, not was nor will be, but only is, has no past, has no future. I believe the Bible is completely absent of verses stating that. Next. Uh, we don't have any verses in the Bible that states that God knows everything that will ever happen, which I believe is your position. Uh, we don't have any verses that show that God can intervene in the past. Of yeah. all of the miracles in the Bible, God never once changes the past. Um, this was mentioned by Mike in, in, in his opening statement. We don't have a single verse in the Bible that says God has decreed everything that will ever happen. Um, we don't have a verse that says God created time. We have no verse that shows that God exists in the past or in the future. And then we have no verse that states that God knew us before the foundations of the earth. And so I believe that those seven categories we would expect to find in the Bible if this idea that God knows the future exhaustively was true, but we don't. On the flip side, we find dozens of verses in each of these categories that God experiences duration in his life and in his existence, meaning he has a past and is temporal. We have dozens of verses stating where, that God says something will happen, but it does not happen. 
dozens of verses where God says he thought something would happen, but it did not happen. Dozens of verses where God says things like uh, certain things never entered his mind, uh, phrases like that. We have many examples where God indicates that the future is uncertain by saying perhaps, by chance, lest, etc. And then we've got uh, many verses. So I like how he's doing this. I'd, I'd probably, if I was going to change one thing, I'd have him give an example. Uh, like God led them in the wilderness to test them to know what was in their hearts. Just every time you throw out a category, throw out a verse along with it. So that way you start spamming the conversation with your proof text. It makes people think not only is he listing out that these verses exist, he's giving us an example of each category, showing it that it exists. And then in the end of the debate, he could point out, hey, look, I gave all these verses. I had all these points and it was just ignored rather than just claiming these verses exist on some sort of list somewhere. I think over two dozen where God repents and changes his mind. And then we have all of the examples throughout the Bible where God shows regret over his own actions. And so when we compare the amount of biblical information missing from the settled view that God knows the future exhaustively and it will only pan out in one way, it is settled, that cannot change. And we contrast that to the hundreds of verses that show the future is open. Hence, I'm an open theist. Um, I do have one prediction that I'd like to make here at the outset. Here, I like and this. And we'll see what happens. Maybe I'll be wrong. <laughs> but I do predict that at some point in our conversation, the argument will go from what does the Bible teach to what do men believe? So he brings this conversation, he brings it all around uh, to the, the, the starting point, which is actually fantastic because this whole debate ends with this point because they start talking about, oh, this is what church history believed and, and you're departing from church history. And so Will Duffy is right about his prediction of what would happen in this debate. You know, he said he hopes he, he's wrong. And he points out that in this debate, God can know what happens in this debate because God's familiar with the individuals who are interacting in, the, in this debate. They prepared for this debate. They put together their little points. And so a great parallel that, that's not actually discussed in the debate is how God knows future events and how Will Duffy was able to accurately predict future events. It wasn't They weren't bludgeoned with this point. But it is actually pretty funny to illustrate the, the, the fact that Will Duffy can know the future. People can know the future. And what do men teach? And I just like to say right at the outset that I am an open theist because I believe this is what the Bible teaches and I do not put any weight or authority in what men teach or believe. Um, <clears throat> I'm so glad you said that, uh, Will, because I agree 100% the Bible. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he does. Right. We don't believe something just because somebody else said it. Right. We don't we don't do that. I, I want to go ahead and jump right into a Q&A with a question of my own. Two, really, I want to make a I want to ask a, a clarifying question. And then I want to ask um, the, the question you said you mentioned that you did not know how this would how this conversation is going to turn out. My first question is, does God know how this conversation is going to turn so out? Notice that's not about the Bible. That's Specifically not regarding what? Just what will happen next? So how do we deal with these things? If we want to talk about the Bible and focus the conversation towards the Bible, and they want to ask you, oh, does God know X, Y, Z? Well, it's like, well... Maybe a good way to answer is uh, we could speculate about that, but I thought this conversation was going to be about the Bible. The biblical data has this and this instance in which God knows this event, but it's not in details, and some of the details are different than than how he knows the events. So that might be actually a good strategy for refocusing to the text 
to try to give illustrations of God imprecisely knowing future events throughout the Bible that don't materialize in detail, but materialize in general sentiment. Uh, the, the general idea of the prophecy comes about, but the details fail. And then that that in that way, you could point out, yeah, so it could be like this biblical event in which God does know generalities about what's going to happen, but the details don't always have to materialize. And then that way, they have to deal with the actual Bible. So bringing, bringing the data set back to the Bible, making them focus on particular texts, being able to use an opportunity to, to add new text to the debate. Uh, they, they'll learn pretty quickly that every time they ask a question like that, you're going to have a chance to put out another proof text that they're going to have to actually fight against the Bible rather than you. They want they want something where you say something about what you believe so then they could say, oh, isn't that terrible, that thing you believe? But if you tie it to that Bible verse, it's really hard for them to uh, <laughs> actually respond in that fashion like, oh, that's so terrible. Because then they're saying that that Bible verse, that Bible passage is so terrible. It forces them to rely on data. So does God know how this debate's going to turn out? Well, God said that Israel would be in captivity for 400 years. They're really in captivity for about 80 years. And Exodus states that they were in Egypt for 430 years. And then you have about 40 years of wandering. So yeah, God does know some things. God does know future things. He has plans for the future. They materialize, not necessarily in all details every time that these things happen. Uh, God can know what's going to happen in this debate generally. That's within his uh, scope of knowledge per the Bible, if we look at how the Bible works and Bible prophecy works. But it's not meticulous detail. And the details don't have to turn out 100%. There could be variation in, in what was claimed would happen and what does turn out, as we see in the Bible. Something like that. Uh, Pixels of Light points out he's fishing for a soundbite, not a biblical answer. So that's the, don't play into what your enemy's strengths are. Their strengths are emoting. Their strengths are, oh, you're so terrible. Oh, you believe this thing? Oh, that thing makes me so sad. If God didn't know everything, if God didn't control the future, then this other <laughs> huge leap of logic thing would be true. Oh, and that makes me so sad. We, we don't want to be dealing with that. We just want to redirect to the Bible, redirect to the Bible. Then they're arguing against the Bible. They're not arguing against you. Ah, so that's that's what I'm going to be trying to do when people try to ask me personal questions like, well, does God know what, what food you're going to eat tomorrow? Redirect to the Bible. Redirect to the Bible. Then they're fighting the Bible. They're not fighting you. It's like that Isaiah debate that I, I love so much in which Madden's trying to say, oh, do you think this about God? I'm like, well, we look back to Isaiah for the data, and he there's a passage in Isaiah where where God says he's going to forget sins. So do we do we take that literally? Do we not take that literally? It's within the realm of possibility that God uh, forgets knowledge purposely or accidentally. It's it's within the realm of possibility per the data that we have in the Bible. Bring it bring it back to the Bible. What will what will have been said? What well, all of these different things? Does God know that right now? Well, that's an interesting question, Tyler. And uh, I'm going to give you an answer that I think you'll be satisfied with. Satisfied with. But right now, think of what God knows. So, so he notice knows that. what I've typed up in my notes. So that that's actually pretty excellent. So he's he's going to say that uh, I'm going to bring us back around to an answer. But let's think through this first. So it gives him time to talk about something that he wants to talk about, and then also being pre-afforded that time to respond. So that, that is a pretty good debate tactic. I, I noticed that the first time around where he con continually does this thing where it's like, I'm going to withhold the answer for just a bit. Just give me a second to talk about it, which which starves off. It, it keeps off uh, interruptions. It, it stops people from jumping in and trying to stop his answer midstream because they're waiting for the answer, but he gets to talk about what he wants in the meantime. He knows the arguments that you have prepared that you're going to say. So there's a lot of things that he knows now that will happen in our discussion. So if you were to have asked me a different question, which was two weeks ago, mm -hmm. did God know exactly what would happen in this conversation? I would say no. Okay, so God learns. It, are you comfortable saying that? 
Well, the Bible says that God learns. Okay. So there we go. Absolutely ah, comfortable. Look at that. Okay, so here's look my question that. then. I want to go to the Bible. Numbers 23, 19 says, <laughs> God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said, and will he not do, or he is. So the, the first verse that they turn to is a pagan a prophet, an enemy of God talking about God. This this is not pointed out in the debate to him. Will Duffy, I think Will Duffy does an okay job responding to this point. But my immediate response to these people is, who's talking? They won't know. Then it's painfully clear to the audience. They don't know the, they don't know the context of their own proof text. They don't. And then you also ask, you know, God says he repents over and over. Why are you elevating the words of an enemy of God, someone who hates God, who God hates, is a, is, a, is a classic enemy of God throughout the Bible. Why are you elevating the words of an enemy of God over God? You see, God says, uh, I repent. I repent I made Saul king. I repent I have made man. Uh, but then you take the words of Balaam, and Balaam trumps God, apparently. And so that puts them in, in this really weird situation where they have to argue that what God is saying is a figurative or it doesn't mean what it means. But a person in the text who's not particularly a friend of God is speaking metaphysical absolute certainty. It's a very funny interaction. I, I have an interaction with with the Calvinist, I think the guy has since become a non-Calvinist, but I have a, a very funny interaction that I put up on the channel in which I'm dealing with him, trying to talk him through this, who's talking in the text, and he just absolutely doesn't know. And it, it's a very it's a very cringeworthy, it's a very painful conversation where, where he's like, oh, I, <laughs> I'm making all these excuses. He just doesn't know the context. And it's great when you show the audience that the person you're talking to is using proof text was zero, zero cognition of what's going on in context, zero, zero understanding of how this verse that they're trying to use for a proof text fits within the narrative in which it's found. It's a fantastic thing to illustrate. Spoken, and will he not make it good? My question is, Will, how is God any different from you and I, according to the open theist view? Of no, notice that he, he, he quotes a Bible verse, and then he asks a question that's not about the Bible. Uh, he 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 quotes a Bible verse, assumes all sorts of strange meanings into it, and then asks a question about his interpretation of the text. So Will Duffy, this would have been a very good opportunity for Will Duffy to redirect the text and say, you know what, you're quoting Balaam. And Balaam's not saying what you think he's saying right there. And then explain the context, as he does much later in the debate in a... Kind of a convoluted way so it, it's it's not a direct way and so he might he might have lost them just a little bit in his explanation of what's going on so it's not addressed head-on when it should be and if it is addressed head-on it's very painfully clear to the audience that only one of the people in the conversation knows the bible god because he sounds like he's learning he's doing all these different things if i knew your notes like i would know what is said i could you know predict fairly accurately how this conversation will go my like i said my question is how so that's very predictable of the calvinist to uh, uh just right away turn to the quote of balaam this is their first proof text this is the text that they think proves that god knows all things past present and future it doesn't have anything to do with those things and it's their primed proof text that they turn to right away how is God different than man in the sense that man repents, man learns? How is God different from your view? Sure. Uh, there, there could not be more difference between us and God. Um, God has dynamic omniscience. And the, the fact that his omniscience is dynamic, that means it is expanding as the world expands. And so okay. you know, there, there's a difference between uh, you know, there's a difference between us learning something, meaning someone has to teach us something versus God taking in information. So there's a huge difference. Um, yeah, go ahead. Right, right, right. But my, my point more so is according from Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie. If God says something is going to happen and that does not happen, God lied, right? Or does, or does God just not know and he was just wrong? No, so I definitely think if we were to, you know, find an example of, of what you're referring to, I think if we examined it, it would actually be your view that makes God a liar and not mine.
So my view is, is that if God says something and he, in, and he actually intends to do it, that if circumstances change, he's righteous. And so he will change because he's righteous. In your view, God says he's going to do something fully knowing he won't. And I would consider that lying. So he missed his opportunity to tie it directly to Jeremiah 18. I don't know if that's on purpose, if he's waiting to see if this guy is going to de deny Jeremiah 18 as a possibility and then provide it as a gotcha. It's like, I just I just literally basically read verbatim what's going on in Jeremiah 18, God's standard operating procedures that you just denied. I don't know if he is waiting for a gotcha or something like that, but it, it is a good opportunity to point out this this is God's standard operating procedure in the Bible. It's not a lie because God states that when circumstances change, God will change his mind and not do what he said he was going to do and not do what he thought he was going to do. If he, I, I forget exactly how you just said it, but you said that, okay, Michael, do you have uh, any questions for, for Will at this point? Uh. Well, as far as questions, I mean, I've got a, a ton of things that I wish I could say. If I had to ask one right now, I guess my main question would be, uh, I can just think. One other criticism for Will Duffy is uh, he seems to not force his debate partner to acknowledge the points that he gives. And so uh, following up with something like, does that make sense? Like, so you could explain the situation in Jeremiah 18. So God states that. God might plan something. God might say he's going to do something. And then the circumstances change. Maybe the people become evil or good people become bad. And then God will, will change his mind about what he said he's going to do and what he thought he's going to do. It doesn't make him a liar. No one's going to describe that as a lie. No one's going to say, oh, God was just lying through his teeth, lying through his mouth, just uh, telling everyone all sorts of lies. It makes sense to us. That's how we live and that's how we operate. If I tell my kids where I'm going to bring them to McDonald's and they start misbehaving and I say, I'm not bringing you to McDonald's anymore, that doesn't make me a liar. No one's going to call that a lie. And the same is true with God. And it's described by God in Jeremiah 18. This is God's standard operating procedure. Then you can follow up with something like, does that make sense? Uh, do you agree with Jeremiah 18? That, that would be actually a pretty funny question to him. Do you agree with Jeremiah 18, which puts him on the defensive? Now he has to explain how his views are in line with a very clear text that says God changes his mind. God doesn't do what he said he's going to do. God doesn't do what he does, doesn't or that he thinks he's going to do. God does something other than what God thought he would do. That's how these things work and uh, puts him on the defensive. So what, what, would it, what does it mean to you, Will, uh, when God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you? What, what was meant there? If indeed he couldn't have even known that Jeremiah's parents would get together and have Jeremiah. Yeah, fantastic question. I think that's Jeremiah. I think Will Duffy drops the ball a little bit on this. Uh, he he gets into this convoluted explanation about um, you're seated in the fallopian tube and then you get to the womb. And the, the ancient Israels were referring to God knew you from the fallopian tube before. Well, just read the verse. Just read the verse. Before you were, I formed you in the womb. I knew you. And so we start out as unformed substance in the womb. This is this is common Israelite fetology that we start out unformed and then we become formed. So it's not before conception. The verse is not not saying before you were ever conceived, I knew you. It, you know, that might be like an English expression, but it wasn't an Israelite expression. It's God forms babies in the womb. He can know these babies before he forms them. That's it's it's an open theist text because it's real time. It's it's not an eternal thing, and Will Duffy does point that out. So to his credit, he points out this has nothing to do with the points you guys are trying to prove. And they keep doing this. They keep bringing up proof texts for this view. <laughs> they keep bringing up uh, proof texts for this view, and guess what? It doesn't prove what they say it's going to prove. My one five, if memory serves me uh, correct. Um, and so what I'd like to point out for you guys both is that number one, as I stated in my opening statement, that verse does not say that Jeremiah was known before the foundations of the earth, but that is your position. What it does say is before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, which is absolutely true. So let's get into biology a little bit because I think that this is important. And I also think that it's fun. Uh, I think he loses people. Life does not start here. in the womb. <laughs> 
life starts in the fallopian tubes and some two to three weeks later, uh, that uh, unique individual tiny human being ends up implanted in the womb. So what that verse is saying is that God intimately knows us from the moment of fertilization. And it's fascinating because think of how incredible God is from the moment of fertilization. Think of every think think of everything that he knows about that individual. He knows their hair color, their eye color, their personality traits, their defects, etc. because he's the one that designed reproduction and the genome. But isn't that part of God forming Jeremiah and his mother's womb? The fertilization, everything from the from the moment the sperm hits the egg, that is God forming Jeremiah. Correct. Yeah. Well, the verse says, "Before I formed you." Before I formed you in the womb, right? And you're saying I knew you. And you're saying that, right? I chose you. I knew you. But the point that I think Mike is getting at is the word is before. You just said. Yeah, so the simple answer to this is that we start as unformed substance. And it, it's, a, it's a quick answer, and it hits them at the heart of what their objection is. They're saying, oh, so that means that they're un, that, that uh, before you're created. No, that's not what it's about. It's about the formation, the development of the baby in the womb. We start as unformed substance, and then we become formed. It's a very quick answer, and they spend a lot of time on this. That this, God knows all this whenever the sperm hits hit, hits the egg or whenever the fallopian tubes like I'm also sharing the link to this chat if anyone wants to join voice I'm going to share it in the God is open Facebook group if anyone wants to come on and talk about this so it's just not me just talking but my point is that is that is what I would say God is forming Jeremiah includes those things this is the text is saying before all that happened I knew you, or I chose you, or I set you apart. I also would like to say, uh, I hope that we would keep in mind here also that this wasn't just written so that we could understand it today in our technological age. It was written so those people then as well could know it, and they certainly would have not had all this information about uh, genomes and then the fallopian tubes, and so it, uh, they would have never understood that part of it. Well, yeah, they would have understood that part, and that's why Will Duffy in his answer should have pointed out the Hebrew view of fetology and if you start with that, you head off these comments, and they you can't they you can't say oh they just didn't know modern biology. Watch what Will Duffy does. He he goes to the Psalms and says, hey, they knew about gravitational forces, so therefore they probably knew about fetology. He could have started out by appealing. This is the Hebrew view of fetology. It's the default one. It's the one we see in Psalms one thirty nine, which describes all my members are written in the book. This is about fetology, development of a baby in the womb. His members are being programmed. His m members are being uh, directed by God. The formation of the baby in the womb is a directed process in, in this view. They would have understood it in the most simplistic way, uh, I think, the way that we would naturally uh, understand it, just passing over it one time. And so what I do, <laughs> uh, since, since I do, I am part of this chat, I do pull up John Calvin on this. And John Calvin points out that it was a Hebrew view of fetology, this development of the womb. You have these different stages in Hebrew thought. So I always like to, to default to John Calvin's own explanation of the Psalms 139 passage, because it does show, it does show that even Calvinists, John Calvin himself understands this view of fetology, understands that this is how fetology works in the Hebrew view. And he's he's fairly authoritative, except for when Calvinists, they, they don't care about what John Calvin says. Like, oh, I don't agree with John Calvin. John Calvin's wrong about what he writes about Psalms 139, my, my proof text in which I'm trying to prove Calvinism. Cal, Calvin's definitely wrong. That's always funny when that happens. Mike talks about the gravitational attraction of stars. So it absolutely was not written just so that they would understand it back then. It was written yeah. so that we would discover the amazing things that God has done. And again, Tyler, it says that God knew him before he was formed in the womb. And I'm here saying that we exist for two to three weeks before the womb. And so number one, this verse does not state your position that God knows the entire future and it's present no. knowledge. No, I never made the claim that it states that God knows the entire future, but I am making the claim that no. this text says that. God knew Jeremiah before Jeremiah existed. 
that's okay. It absolutely does not say before he existed. Okay. Good job, Will. Right. That, it's just it's and and this it sounds like it's going to be. This is my interpretation of the Bible. This is your interpretation of the Bible, and we just split ways of that. I don't want to do that, Will. I want to understand why you're saying because the text is clear. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, is that a literal like before they actually before? I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't so I shared this with uh, Will Duffy. Will Duffy should have been able to see it if he was in that particular view to show all the different screens. This is Calvin's commentaries on Psalms 139. The Calvinists turn there and they say, oh, this is about all our days being preordained uh, from time eternal. Every day of our life is controlled. John Calvin didn't think so. He points out that he says this. So some read Yom in the nominative case when the days were made in the sense being according to them. So this is according to the people who are translating. All my bones were written in thy book, O God, from the beginning of the world, when days were first formed by thee, and when as yet none of them actually existed. He says, the other is the more natural meaning, that the different parts of the human body are formed in a succession of time, for in the first germ there is no arrangement of parts or proportion of members, but is developed and takes a particular form progressively. Babies develop in the womb. This is the Hebrew idea of fetology. This is what's being described when people are chosen from the womb. Paul says, you called me from the womb. Jeremiah says, before you formed me in the womb, you knew me. These are the, the in utero calls. This is not about before you ever existed, you're being called. Not saying, I'm not saying that there's not instances in the Bible in which people are chosen well before they're conceived. Those things do happen. But these are not proof texts of that. The, the, the Jeremiah verse is not, the Paul verse is not. Instead, those verses are God in real time doing something. God in real time choosing prophets for himself. God in real time looking at these babies and trying to use them. And what's actually pointed out by Will Duffy, which is actually pretty great, is that it's not always successful. And, and he's only prompted to do that after they start pressing him on that issue. So maybe we could get that to that real quickly. I don't know here. exactly how it all works. But what I'm trying to explain, and it doesn't seem like you're getting it, is that that process from, from sex of the parents to, to all, of, all of the development, everything that goes on with that embryo, with that God, this text is saying that before all that, God chose Jeremiah, God set Jeremiah apart, and that would require God to know Jeremiah before all of that happens. Sure. So yeah, notice what, what they do. What you're saying Ty they, they just say their proof text and then they say how they read their proof text. And Will Duffy could have probably emphasized better that they're they're not reading the proof text. Uh they, they just aren't the verse objectively does not say that. Uh, Jeremiah was known before he existed. It objectively says that he's known before it's formed. It's not a proof text for their their view. This is an irrelevant text. And he does point out in the in the end of the debate that all their proof texts did not prove the things that they're attempting to prove. Tyler, is that you, you're interpreting you know the the actual word womb there as everything else, and I'm actually taking it literally, which is that God actually I do yeah. believe God knew Jeremiah before Good emphasis. he was formed in the womb. And secondly, I would like to point out that it doesn't make a lot of sense for God to say that I knew you before you were formed in the womb when he could have easily said, I knew you before the foundation of the world, which is what your position is. So as I stated in my opening Certainly. statement, if we had scripture that said God knew us before the foundation of the world, then my theology, open theism, would be false. Say what she was going to say, Mike. So that it's interesting what he's doing here. He's using phrases from the Bible that are going to spark their curiosity and then force the conversation to a certain proof text that he's pre-prepped for. So this is actually a very good debate strategy, although it might not be one I would take. I, would, I probably wouldn't be doing their work for them or trying to lead them into that trap. I'd probably just say it doesn't mean that he's known from time eternal. There's no verses like that. It's nowhere in the Bible. But Will Duffy uses this specific phrase from the foundation of the world, which prompts them very predictively to start talking about revelation, which gives Will Duffy a very good opportunity to bring them through the proof texts over in Revelation. So it seems to be very 
a very planned event by Will Duffy to lead them in this direction and to direct the conversation to these talking points, which which he already prepared for. I think I think Will Duffy did a really good job at predicting and knowing the future about what was going to be said by who and when. Well, we know. Well, we know that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. But no, I would I would certainly no. object to the idea that because uh, this specific phraseology is not used, uh, you can't use anything to support your view that would indicate some, that God has something more than this kind of working knowledge. And I would also point out that certainly I'm go- I plan if I get very many opportunities to speak to quote for many great Christians throughout history because the scriptures tell us <laughs> yeah, that iron sure. sharpens iron. We should be. T- there's his prediction coming true in real time. Oh, it's so good. So you get them in this nice catch-22 when you make these predictions. So either you diffuse what they're going to say, or you get to point out later that they did exactly what you're, they're going to say. So um, I always remember back to the Ben Shapiro debate with Pierce Morgan about guns. And uh, Ben Shapiro starts the whole debate by saying, you're a bully. These are the things you do. Uh, you try to you you just stand and and you you make your uh, point on on the graves of dead children and it's like you're a bully. This is your tactic. And and he Pierce Morgan had people in the audience from families of gun victims, and he couldn't use them. He couldn't use this debate tr- strategy because it just affirms everything that Ben Shapiro said he was going to do. So it was a trap. So it's uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, either he could use them, try to get his emotional thing across, and then then Ben Shapiro could point out that he is the bully that was predicted, or he forgoes it and has to come up with real arguments. It's fantastic. I, I, that's that's kind of what's, uh, what went on with Will Duffy, him saying that you're going to fall back on the positions of men. So either they're going to go do that, or they're forced to forego that and then give up one of their talking points. It's a great strategy. Taking advantage, we stand on the, the shoulders of giants. And I would point out that Will has also already come out with uh, his terminology that's unique to open theism. And he's uh, told us about uh, dynamic omnipotence and how God's uh, knowledge expands. And so we're all going to use. Yeah, Jacob writes, if God needs a specific person, can he engineer a specific egg, sperm, and ensure their union? Of course, yeah. Uh, that That is a great point that God can build people. He could put them together. He could... Our, our genetics have a lot to do with our personality. Um, you know, high IQ people have high IQ babies. Very outgoing people tend to have outgoing babies. Criminality is is inheritable. It's like a thirty percent, which is it's not like a hundred percent. If your dad's a criminal, that you're going to be a criminal. But uh, there is a higher genetic component than just random happenstance. It's it's not a thirty percent in the general population. It's more I don't know, like five or ten percent. Uh, so things can be known about our genetic makeup. Things can be known. You, Our babies come out looking like us. There, There's a lot to know about genetics. There's a lot that you can know about babies before they're born just by knowing the genetic makeup, who their parents are. And yeah, God can conceivably build people. He can engineer people. And that's a possibility that we have to deal with in these texts. Did God engineer Jeremiah? Very possibly. The text doesn't necessarily read that to me. It reads more like that God was watching Jeremiah, that he sees him being formed, and then he decides to choose him based on the things that he observes. So if God's observing something in real time and choosing someone in real time, that is open theism. So if if the Jeremiah verse is is working out like, like I think it is, that's open theism directly in that verse, their own proof text, their own proof text tend to, whatever they quote a proof text, it, t- it tends to be actually evidence against their beliefs. These things that came before a little bit, uh, uh, but, I, and again, I would challenge even things that were said earlier that uh, our position is nowhere taught in Scripture. I've always been against, to me, I can present you 8,000 verses. It's just as bad as presenting one verse. Uh, if I'm isolating some- Look at what they're doing here. So he's he's going to try to point out that, uh, he's, he's going to say, well, I just look at the whole Bible you know, I don't just look at one particular verse because he knows in his heart he doesn't have a verse. He doesn't have any proof text, not a single proof text. So he has to appeal to this mythical, like everything fits together with my view, but none of my verses actually say the things that uh, I teach. It's a very strange mindset to be in to claim that your view is not expressly taught anywhere in the Bible. The Bible's a big book. 
a Bible has a lot of pages. It's written by a lot of authors over a wide, wide variety of subjects. And so to claim that your view isn't taught anywhere there and you're holding on to that view, that's a, that's a very strange, strange claim. Um, I think it stretches the limits of what a rational person should believe. Solitary verses, but what we what we try to do uh, in traditional uh, Protestant Christianity, with a traditional understanding of traditional theism, is yeah. How often do you hear these people when they're talking about God claim God's immutable, or God controls all things, or that that God knows all future events, or or even that oh we got Drew on, we got Drew on, I got out of the stream, whether he likes it or not, he's he's now live. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Yeah, so so here's the question. How often do you hear people talking about God and they, they talk about him being immutable or controlling all things or being timeless? Have you heard that where, where you're like a normal conversation, you're listening to a normal sermon and, and someone will just start talking about God being timeless? Mm, Has that ever happened sure. to you? Yeah. Sure. How often does it happen to the Bible? The Bible is a huge book. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Yeah, you. I only hear that objection raised when I start talking about, like, I don't know, theological issues or something like that. Oh, well, didn't you know that God is timeless? You know, because He created time and stuff. But <laughs> you, you would think that if uh, Isaiah's trying to, let's say, you're in Isaiah 40 or so, if Isaiah's trying to explain to Israel why God's the true God. He might want to throw that out there so that they can know that God is timeless. If, if that, in fact, was the case, that that might be the great place that he could put that information because they didn't. They don't appear to believe that God even knew present events. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, they they go to the hillside, and there's a bunch of people, and they're sacrificing to these false gods in a hill, and and God opens up a door so that uh, Ezekiel could go in and they, he could see these demonic practices going on in Egypt. They don't believe that God can see them in real time. You, you would think that, <laughs> that the fact if God was timeless and had this omniscience of all events uh, all, at all times. Well, that... you see, you see, Chris, he's speaking to us in a way that we can understand. Uh, you know, he's caught, he's got to bring, he's got to bring it down on our level. You know, if he talked about him being timeless, we just wouldn't understand that. You know, so uh, he's got yeah, to you know. bring it down to our level. He, he can't tell us these critical things that, you know, that might be debate over. Uh, maybe he wasn't, he was trying to make it not debate over so easy for these false gods that God's up against something like that. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm going to hit play. Have you, have you listened to any of this so far? Not, not at all, actually. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so right I just now, thought I would jump on. These people, they're trying to explain to Will Duffy that since God knew Jeremiah before he formed him in the womb, apparently that means open theism is false. Right, right. And I guess they've gone over this. He's he's numbered our days or written my our days in the book. Have they talked about that already? No, they, they don't actually bring that up at all, which was actually kind of surprising to me because I thought they'd go from there to, to Psalms 139. But uh, what happened was I was on their call and I could share my screen. So I shared this Calvin commentary in which Calvin actually talks about uh, Hebrew fetology, how they see right. the baby starting unformed and then forms in the womb. And so the Jeremiah passage is not about God knowing someone timeless, elite, eternal, or even before the person's conceived, but from that first stage of fetology, God God sees the unformed baby who then becomes formed. Mm. Yeah, I've always thought that was interesting. I've never really heard any good responses from people when I'm like, by the way, Calvin says this, and they're like, oh. <laughs> uh, you know what happens? You know what happens? Uh, the Calvinists I interact with say, I don't agree with everything Calvin says. They're like, okay, yeah, yeah. but what about yeah, the yeah. possibility that perhaps Calvin is right here? Perhaps right, perhaps right. that is, perhaps your proof text is not a proof text. Have you ever right. thought about that maybe? Uh, they yeah. don't, they, they don't want to lose a proof text. Um, I think it was the, it was uh, N.T. Wright, I think was having a discussion with James White. And it was about the I am usage in John. I, th I think that's that. It was, it was either him or Sanders. I'm pretty sure it was N.T. Wright. And N.T. Wright had a different reading of the verse than James White. And James Wright says, he says, uh, if, if that's true, then we lose a verse 
for the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> like his argument was, we can't accept your reading of that verse because then we'll lose an argument for the Trinity. It's like, this is the level of discourse. And it's funny. So I'll, I'll go ahead, yeah. ahead and hit play and just let me know if you if you hear it. We try to take the entire scriptures, read them in an exegetical fashion, uh, and then we can highlight a verse if we see perspicuity of scripture, analogy of faith, that it's presenting a truth that is, is, is just kind of pounded into our head over and over. And so his argument read, is, for instance, in the we have no single we one that, verse, uh, the lot is cast but in the, the whole lap, Bible every outcome position. is from the Lord. That's a very mundane task that we might uh, liken to flipping a coin or rolling a dice today, but it's every outcome from the Lord. When we read that the king's hand is like uh, the, the king's heart is like rivers that, of water. That casting lots Lord, verse, man. Every will. <laughs> when we read, God, God, God's the reason I wa I lost at uh, Boardwalk that game. I love you know. I love your um. Uh, God determines lots. Step two. Uh, step three. <laughs> divine immutable pre-creation decree. <laughs> well, it's 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 a huge jump in logic, but it's it's what they have to resort to because. As this guy is explaining in no uncertain terms, he has no proof text to point out what he believes. And so he has to grab all these little parts from the Bible and say, if you hold my theology true, these verses will, in fact, work with the theology that I have. It's <laughs> it's like, okay, what about the verses that don't work with your theology? Yeah. What do you do with those? Those sure. are anthropomorphisms. You, you could... You, Anyone could grab like a handful of verses and say, oh, my theology works with all these verses. See how this verse reads? That fits my theology. It, this is this, this is how they do theology. That Samson's desire for a Philistine woman was of the Lord. Uh, and I could go on forever, but I don't want to take up too much time. But yes, there is sure. ample evidence. Uh, we read Isaiah 10 that he decrees what the Assyrians will do, uh, and then yeah. he punishes them for it because their free will is compatible with his decree. Acts 4, 27, 28. Again, there's countless verses, and we put those verses together, and we come up with a consistent exegesis that seems to say, yes, the Lord does indeed decree whatsoever comes to pass in his universe, and it makes sense because he has a purpose. Nowhere in Scripture we given the idea that his purpose was simply to create and kind of see what happens and hope for the best or try to get the outcome that he wanted. And again, I would ask Will, if that's indeed what he's doing— why does he constantly demand worship and, 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 and to be glorified? And why are the angels surrounding him saying, holy, holy, holy? Yeah, he's like, because I sure wouldn't if what you describe is true. And, and I, I had a chance to either worship God in heaven like the angels do or not. I would choose the not. I would not worship God. And the angels, they would agree with me. They also would not. The fact that the angels worship God means that they agree with me about who God is. It's such a weird and argument. And this is part of what we encountered in the debate that we had was God has step one. God has purposes. Step two, uh, uh, step three, pre-creation, immutable divine decree. Like what? <laughs> he said, God has purposes. Sure. Okay. That's <laughs> like, okay. So you, you got, you got to actually walk through. Okay. Did God plan something? Okay. Sure. Did, did that thing come about? Okay. Um, does everything that God plans, did, do those come about? And so, you know, open theists agree that God is powerful. He can do things. And so it's it's not particularly surprising to us when God can, in fact, do stuff. What's interesting is the times that he tries to do stuff and fails or tries to do stuff and then circumstances change. So he changes his mind. Those are the interesting things. Uh, not, not these other, you know, God doing stuff successfully. I don't think anyone mm -hmm. would take issue with that. But... Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm interested guy. to know too, and I'll I'll let you play. But I'm interested to know for any Calvinists that end up watching this, do they believe that God fails at sanctifying them and making them more holy? I would because, say they wouldn't. Why? Why would? Okay, you'd have to walk me through that. Yeah. Well, you know, because every time we sin, right, we're we're fulfilling God's immutable decree. But then God obviously doesn't. He doesn't want us to sin, right? So is God failing? In, well, like I'll be the Calvinist for a second. So God has two wills. He has a, de a <laughs> declared will in which he wants us to act morally. He wants us to act without sinning. But then he has a secret will, which means that everything that happens happens to his greatest glory. And so he declares these things that if people violate those things, 
um, you know, that's bad and they get punished for that. Or in the case of a, a Christian who violates those things, uh, that's covered by Jesus's blood to his greatest glory. But that wasn't his secret will or that uh, we're violating. It was his declared will. And but God's activity, like his activity in us, is he is he not wanting us? I just don't I, because I don't think in these categories. Right. I just don't understand how you fit that. God's like sanctifying us. He wants you to not sin and you sin. God can't fail. So he must not just be trying. He must just not be trying hard enough to get you to stop sinning. Because it's it's not his secret will. His secret will is what's actually going to happen. His moral will is just like a prescriptive thing that yeah. we should do. Like oh, So here's the analogy that they, they often use. They, they say, oh, that you know that your kid's going to fail, but you give them the command anyways, knowing that they are going to fail, and that's for a purpose. Although you declared that they're not going to fail, you really knew that they were going to fail for this, I don't, you know, it's it's very duplicitous. Yeah. And yes. I, I'll hit play. I don't think they go into anything like that here in this debate, but that's, that's in my experience, how they would respond to that. As if he is just the greatest thing that we could possibly fathom if actually he's a lot like us. Uh, cool. I, I'd like to respond to a few things. Um, this is Will Duffy. So, Mike, yeah, sorry, you, you, you said a lot there. Um, number one, and I'd like to just get a couple things out here before we dive into these. Um, you said that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. That is absolutely not true. Uh, the uh, the crucifixion was about 2,000 years ago. It was not before the foundation of the world. <laughs> I like Number how he points two, that out. That's funny. All of those verses that you just said, Mike, have nothing to do with what our topic right now. <laughs> all these verses you were saying, you know, the lot cast into the lap, the king's heart as the river, Acts 4, 27, 28. None of those have anything to do with God knowing the future. So I feel like you're maybe getting confused trying to maybe defend like Calvinism or something, but that's not what we're talking about. We're trying to see if the Bible teaches if God knows the future or not, and none of those verses are relevant. Well, it, you just, I, I like that you brought up the crucifixion, Will, because I wanted to ask you about the crucifixion. Do you believe that? It's, uh, so all those verses were given, and at the end of the debate, the the main guy, the Tyler Fowler guy comes on, and he says, well, you didn't respond to a bunch of our verses. It's like, well, he did respond. He, um, the, the debate's kind of about this, and those verses had nothing to do with that. And that's what he's referring to. That's what Tyler Fowler is referring to, is this instance in which Will Duffy gives this blanket statement that none of these verses have anything to do with the topic. And that's what they'll like to do. They'll like to say And they can't track. see that, right? They can't see that it doesn't have to do with the topic, and that's part of the problem. But yeah, I think it's because they have this idea of who God is, and their verse, they read it as fitting that idea. So therefore, if they quote their verse in a debate and then explain how it fits their system, that means the system's true. Mm. It's it's this weird. Eh, uh, the best way, the best way to describe it is kind of like uh, a cult, where where you have your cult system, and all the evidence that you present, you present only in light of this system. And you can't put yourself into someone else's shoes to see how your evidence doesn't necessarily mean your belief and fits their system. So then you also think that this, this evidence is solely evidence and proof of your system. Although it's not, it can fit multiple different systems, but you're presenting it as proof of your system because when you read it, you think about your system. Is this weird, weird bubble mindset. And the weird thing about their accusation, you don't understand Calvinism all the time, is that they're often, not always, but often they seem unable to understand anyone else's perspective on passages. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing about proof text. If your proof text has a natural alternative reading that makes sense, that fits your opponent's views, it's not a proof text. It doesn't prove your point and not theirs. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Will Duffy says, yeah, that's my view too. Uh, before we're formed in the womb, God can know us. Doesn't doesn't prove my view is false. It's not a proof text for your view and against ours. And it gets really tedious interacting with these people, having to explain that each and every time they quote a proof text. This is not a proof text. What What's actually happening is you have a talking point. You throw a verse out and then explain what you think about this verse without considering if, if it actually proves your view, if it's actual evidence for your view, 
or if it's just ancillary to your view, but can fit other views as well. It's an inability to uh, pass the intellectual Turing test. Do you know what an intellectual Turing test is? I've heard it before, but I don't remember. Yeah. So Alan Turing was a computer scientist, uh, developed computers, invented computers, and he had the test to try to figure out if computers had reached sentience, if computers could accurately uh, trick individuals who are interacting with the computers to trick the people into thinking that it's a real human. At that point, they they win the Turing test. The, the computers win it, and and they they get assigned whatever value that that they're, they're, they're actually human or sentient. And so the intellectual Turing test along the same lines is if the, you have an intellectual opponent and you can so accurately mimic their arguments such that no one could tell the difference between you and a true believer, you're gonna win that Turing test. I don't think any of these Calvinists can win, win the intellectual Turing test. They, they wouldn't be able to accurately pass as, as a member of uh, that, uh, of, of uh, the people who they're, they're, they're intellectual opponents. Mm. I, I remember there's a story from uh, Bob Enyart and he was running Colorado right to life. And all these pro abort people from Planned Parenthood would try to infiltrate the group and their mannerisms, their way of talking, their, their ways of phrasing would give them away instantly. So if you're referring to as an unborn baby, as a fetus, yeah. Uh, chances are you're, you're not a pro-life person. Uh, the, right. the, these mannerisms expose you. You're not accurately able to understand. It's like Lori Tom and or Lori Ta, Laura, I don't know her name, but she went on the Daily Show. And she's like, "Oh, I agree with the pro-choice position because it's a woman's choice." It's like you're you're she fundamentally failed to understand the pro-life position that this is a human being and killing a human being is murder, and her unable to be to accurately represent the pro-life position was a big red flag to all the conservatives who saw that clip. Uh, she's, she's a pretender. Uh, Tommy Lauren was her name. She's a pretender. Uh, she's, she's a yeah, grifter. Her name. Yeah. 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 Because it's, it's it. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, did you see our episode with Derek and Luke? I wonder uh, if, I wonder if, I wonder if Derek and Luke could, um, could represent our perspective. Well, they didn't. They did an episode on Romans nine. I think it's called. Uh, we had them on. It was called um, uh, Romans nine settled once and for all, or something like that. Anyways, it'd be interesting to see if they could represent provisionism or yeah, uh, that, a non-Calvinistic idea. That would be interesting. It would be interesting to do a debate where you flip roles and have to positively make the case from the other position. And uh, then pass it off to third-party people who are unfamiliar with any debaters, and see who who can pass as the opponent's side, and who who is an obvious. I would I would love to do that sometime. I would love to. That would be fantastic. I've I've had an open invitation online in the 101 group for a while to say, hey, who wants to swap roles with me? I'll be you, and you be me. You know, let's talk through the different proof texts. And I don't think that uh, I don't think they'd be able to do that, but. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and put play on this guy. Jesus died for your sins. Yes. How could he have done that if he didn't even know who you were, what sins you would commit? Do you believe uh, I like people died so that you would have uh, freedom in this country? Categorical difference, my friend. God is dying. Mm -hmm. oh, let me no. Okay, so so did you see that argument? So there's they said, do you think Jesus died for your sins? Well, Duffy says yes. And he says, "How could he die for your sins, if uh, how could he die for your sins if he doesn't know your sins?" And so Will Duffy asked the counter question: "Did American uh, soldiers die for your freedom?" And instantly he says, "Oh, those are categorically different." Did he demonstrate that these are categorically different, or does he just assume that on the text? Maybe when the Bible talks about Jesus's death. It's using that same general category where soldiers can die for our freedom and Christ can die for our death. But since that doesn't fit the format of how he believes the atonement works, and he starts asking atonement questions in this debate, since it doesn't fit his categories of atonement, he claims it's a category error without it's demonstrating. It's ad hoc category creation. They do it like breathing. There's two of everything. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, for it to be a category error, they need to demonstrate that the author of any text that they're referring to accepts their categories and not Will Duffy's categories, or else they, in fact, they're the ones with the category error, unless that's demonstrated. 
And, and if it's not demonstrated, then who's to say that the authors accept their categories rather than Will Duffy's? Again, it's not a proof of anything. It's just assuming your own position and then debating your own position that you already hold as if your position's true, which is actually really funny. I, I, I've, I know that you've experienced this. I've seen you experience this in which they debate as if their position's already true. And if you don't accept the position that they assumed into the debate, then they get mad. It's like, that's what we're debating here. That's, that's right. the subject of this discussion. Yeah. Well, so you have to understand there's two different, it's like, right. But, but that's what we're contending with. <laughs> we don't agree with these categories. Like, yeah, that, yeah. that's, that's what we're debating here. We're trying to figure out if it's true and your proof text doesn't, doesn't say it is. Seriously. Well, God, Jesus bore your sins on the cross, correct? That's what Isaiah, that's what Peter says. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, the cross is not a mathematical equation. Uh, the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient to save any number of people. That's why and I God asked the if... Father, hold on. God the Father applies that sacrifice to anyone's sins when they are saved. So Jesus didn't bear your personal sins. He just died for sin in general. And whoever would accept him is, is given that, right? There's no personal aspect to it is what I'm asking. Your personal sins that you commit on a daily basis, did Christ die? Did, did Christ bear those? So I, I switched back over to uh, some video feed of this guy. But it's interesting. Uh, Matt Slick tried to make the same argument uh, during the Will Duffy debate. It was before the Will Duffy debate. And so I was talking to Matt Slick uh, face to face and my dad was there actually. And uh, he said, well, God, in order to have died for your sins, he must have had some ledger or account balance of all sins that would ever happen. And that's what was nailed to the cross. It's like, what? what are you talking about? Have you heard anyone ever claim this, that if God didn't know all the sins that would ever happen in the future, then he couldn't have died for our sins. It couldn't have paid for it. And so I, I instantly use a, like a Bill Gates example. I say, hey, Bill Gates has a lot of money, right? That guy does. So what if he determines to pay off everyone's mortgages in the United States? All he had to do is accept it. Uh, you don't, He doesn't need to ha have the exact ledger of all debts ever made. He just has to have enough money to cover any anyone who wants to opt into this program. And that's probably more what's going on in this in this scenario that God is putting up a trust fund that everyone could tap into at some point. And he didn't really have a response to that. And I guess the issue in their mind is that they think they think paid. So they think it's been paid. And they're also they, they've also got all this unconditional election, you know, limited atonement stuff in their brains. And so then you're, you know, battling with all these other ideas. But they're thinking paid. And one thing that was helpful for me in thinking about this is, is 1 John 2.2 2 says, uh, you know, for he is the propitiate, he, what does it say? Now that I'm live, I'm like blinking, but <laughs> he, he is the propitiation, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it's he is the propitiation, not like he was. So Jesus became a living sacrifice. It's not like he had this commercial exchange that he paid a certain amount. It's that he is a propitiation, you know, in the same way that Bill Gates, Bill Gates account is like it, it is available. So. Yeah. So pixels of light. I know uh, pixels of light cares very much about atonement. I'm not, I'm not like an atonement theory guy who, who uh, talks for hours about atonement theories, but Pixels of Light says, many people's conclusions are wrapped up in a strict penal substitution payment theory of atonement. If this isn't held to, most of these tensions disappear. Yeah, there's like a half a dozen atonement theories, all of which are options. It's not even like an open theist issue. And all you have to do is say, you know, the debate's not about atonement theories. Any one of those other atonement theories can be true and uh, open theism's true. And even if it's... It, even you could hold to the penal substitution payment theory as long as it's not like this strict account balance that Matt Slick thinks it is. These these are options. And the, what what uh, the Calvinists really don't like you doing is uh, answering, well, how can this be the case? And then you explaining seven different ways that something could be the case that people could hold on to and be open theists because they their their actual goal is to try to get you to talk about what you believe and then attack what you believe. They don't like to attack seven different uh, variations of what people could believe to solve one of their problems. It's actually pretty funny. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, as I stated, I don't believe that the cross was a mathematical equation, meaning if I committed different sins, the crucifixion would have been different. Or if I committed more sins, it would have been different. Or less sins, it would have been different. Nothing would have changed that. But Jesus didn't die for you specifically. He died for the world. Yeah, I believe he died for the world, as the so Bible you, says. So do you deny <laughs> substitutionary atonement? See, they want to talk about it from, no, no, from an open theist perspective. So Will Duffy does the right thing. I hate thing to here. do this, Tyler, but it's not on topic. And so if we go off on all these rabbit trails, we're gonna it's gonna be a mess for the audience. I, I want to focus on does the Bible teach if God knows the future or not? Just a simple open I, theist. Actually, really, I have to object here, and I hate to to do so, but I do have to object. I, don't I, think I, that I have to object. I really, I really uh, want look, to talk we're about just looking for verses that either say uh, that, uh, that say, hey. Uh, God knows everything that's ever going to happen in the future, or a verse that says God does not. That's not how exegesis works, and I would submit that every verse I've submitted so far is exegetically consistent with the idea that we're presenting, uh, just as the, just as uh, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I know that it it's happened exegetically consistent, ago, but it's the yeah. statement the lamb was slain. With the idea that we're presenting, this idea that we're presenting can be read into these passages. Yeah, so we have we have a system that deals with this verse. I, I, it's okay. Is that an argument for your position being true and Will Duffy's position being false? Does Will Duffy's position deal with? I actually didn't hear a verse. I did, actually didn't hear them talk about any specific verse, talking about any specific atonement, anything like that. They're just now talking general atonement theory, which which is actually pretty funny that they're not pointing it to a verse to talk about what that verse actually states. Hmm. before the foundation of the world is wrong it's not me that's wrong it's john the beloved who's wrong because that's what he wrote in revelation 13 8. john the beloved the point that i was making was that christ wasn't a possibility that he might be slain it was a guarantee because this is what god had decreed before the foundation of the universe hey mike are you open to being wrong about your interpretation of revelation 13 8 i i like how will duffy throws this out because it puts them in a it, it it attempts to prime them it's priming them for maybe having to go back on their word here so he's prepping them and then he's going to offer evidence and then see if they're going to take that evidence i think it's a good strategy absolutely can we discuss it right now this is what will duffy wanted to discuss he, he uses in previously me, in this debate fine. i don't know he throws out you know, God didn't know Jeremiah from the foundation of the world. It seems like a purpose, purposeful use of that clause in order to flag their memory to make them say, oh, yeah, look at this verse in Revelation and then focus the debate to this issue. So Will Duffy seems to be steering the debate with this tactic by priming their minds to come up with these arguments that they would have in the recesses of their minds anyways. And so then it gives him an opportunity to talk about these verses in detail how much time Tyler wants to take on individual verses, but it is relevant to the subject. So I, I think we can take, I said we take time. I, I'd yeah, like to hear. I think so. Absolutely. Okay, cool. All right. So I'm going to pull up my Bible here real quick and we will go to revelation 13 verse eight. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All right. If we want to exegete this, which means use scripture to interpret scripture. What we find is that the prepositional phrase of the lamb slain is describing ownership of the book of life. And the prepositional phrase from the foundation of the world is referring to the book of life. Yeah. yeah so this is, this is an interesting point on, on Duffy's part. So I've, I've heard this from Duffy before. He thinks the prepositional phrase from the foundation of the world is referring to the book. I think it's referring to the names not written because in both contexts, they talk about names not written and then it's oppo, it's sense, from the foundation of the world. So uh, just like, here's here's Warren McGrew, we'll add him to the stream as well. And so there, there's a passage in, I believe it's Luke, in which they talk about all the blood of the prophets slain since the foundation of the world. That doesn't mean that all the prophets like died eternally. It's talking about all the prophets who died from the start of the world until now, add all that blood up together. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the prophets slain since the foundation of the world. And so if we're talking about names not written, 
it's from the from the foundation of the world until now these names have not been written in this book and those are the people who are going to be worshiping the beast so it seems like the most natural um the object of that preposition is the names not written rather than the book of course the book is from the foundation of the world or whatever it, it seems to be this a book that uh, just gets added into uh, as as things change but the names are not written since the foundation of the world these these people have never been believers they're the ones worshiping in the beast what are your thoughts on that yeah well the issue here too is that they think uh in the esv it says before and so they think <laughs> you know we made a meme i forget what, exactly what it was but it was you know <laughs> oh. slain from the foundation of the world and they're like before the foundation of the world it's like no it doesn't say before it says from it's the same thing as the Isaiah 46, 10 verse, where it says, declare the end from the beginning. It doesn't say before the beginning. It says from, like, if words are to mean things, if I said, you know, hey, you know, I've got time today, Chris, you know, we can chat from, from 1.30. From 1.30 doesn't mean before 1.30. If I said <laughs> from 1.30 to you, and then you got on at 1.20, then I'm not going to be there because I didn't say before, I said from. So I don't understand why this is difficult. <laughs> like You might be um, there. You might be prompt. My wife wouldn't be there. She's never prompt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think that's interesting. In this debate, this guy continually says, he uh, he actually pulls it up. I, I wonder if we could get to that quick. He, he says, I got the Greek in front of me. It says before the foundation of the world. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say it. It's apo. It's from. It's since. Since the foundation of the world. The name's not written since the foundation of the world. Uh, those are not found in the book of life of the slain lamb, the slain lamb's book of life. It's a possessive, as Will Duffy points out. And we know that's true because we got parallel statements. We got parallel verses that talk about this of the lamb slain and or it, it as the book of life from the foundation of the world. So the prepositional phrase from the foundation of the world is present, but it's definitely not attributed to the lamb slain. That preposition is not found in context. What is in context is the book of life, as Will Duffy thinks it refers to, and the names not written, which I think it refers to. I think it's modifying the names not written. And so they don't seem to understand the argument. I don't know if Will Duffy, it's his phrasing, but they don't seem to catch on to the, the things he's saying. He points out two parallel verses to talk about ownership of the book of life. And I will demonstrate that now. If we go to Revelation 17, also verse 8, it says, The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. So we have scriptures telling us specifically that the book of life is from the foundation of the world. And then if we go to Revelation 20. So I, I think he misses an opportunity in this discussion back and forth. I think he should have put in the question, what does the prepositional phrase from, from the foundation of the world, what does it modify in that specific verse? Then it forces them to pick an object of that uh, prepositional phrase. And then, he's, then he could point out that in the previous verse that they really want to say that the Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, uh, he could point out why doesn't it refer to the same object in this verse over here, and then they have to special plead. Oh, I don't. <laughs> well, well, look at look at the language too that's being used here. We're talking about from, and even if we concede that apo meant before, which it doesn't, we're using language that denotes sequence. It doesn't say the lamb was slain always in eternity. It, it it these are these are these are references to time, which is like completely contrary to their entire line of argumentation, but they just don't even see it. Yeah, so even if it was, that's a very good point. Even if it was referring to the lamb slain, since it's using the word sense, um, that means you take the starting point, which is the creation of the world, the foundation of the world, whatever that means, and now, and that means the event happens somewhere between those two points of time, which uh, at Paul's time when he's writing that, that was, I don't know, 10, 20 years earlier. And so, yes, Christ was slain since the foundation of the world. He was he was killed between the time of the foundation of the world and the time Paul is writing. Yes, that is a possibility, uh, but it doesn't mean pre-creation, divine creed, doesn't mean God controls everything, doesn't mean God knows all future truth proposition phrases, anything like that. And and they don't they don't get it. They don't get it. 
21, this is the final verse, uh, verse 27, it says, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, yeah. which could also be written the book of life of the Lamb. This is possessive. And so Revelation 13, 8, I'm going to reword it just so that people understand the argument that I'm making, and then you can respond. If it said this, it would be completely grammatically correct and exegetically correct. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the Lamb Slain's book of life from the foundation of the world. Mike, what are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, I, I appreciate uh, the time taken, but uh, I'm not convinced. Uh, I have here, of course, the Greek in front of me, which is the Texas Receptus that tells me that it is also uh, perfectly fine grammatically to translate written in the slain lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. Um, he just said from. <laughs> yeah, so it's, that's actually pretty funny that he's like, okay, so we can translate this uh, to mean what we're trying to claim from it. That's his argument. Well, that's not a proof text if it allows the various translations and those other translations perfectly align with views that are not yours that you're trying to refute. It's just not a proof text. And I, I, they, they don't seem to comprehend what is a proof text and what is. And my theory is that they don't have any proof text, and so they're desperate to try to grab anything. That was my theory there. And they just don't understand his point, right? When he says, I'm not convinced, he means, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> like, if, like, and I mean this. I mean this with respect to him. But if Will yeah. Duffy in the situation were to ask, and maybe maybe he'll go on to articulate his position, I'll be wrong. But if you were to go on to ask, do you understand what I'm saying? Can you kind of articulate to me what you hear, what it is you hear I'm saying? Because you say you're not convinced, but I just want to make sure you understand me first. I don't think he. I don't think he's following. I I think you're right there. I think that would actually be a very good strategy to try to get them to repeat back to you what you said so that they can illustrate that they they're tracking mentally. Okay, so uh, it's not the New King James, but I think the ESV. Okay. ESV uh, translates one of these before. <laughs> yes, ESV translates. I, I think I looked this up. I think he's got the Texas Receptus, which is the majority text, and that's definitely Oppo. And I, I think I looked it up in, in the critical addiction, editions, and those also are Oppo. So I don't think there's any pro, uh, which pro is the prefix for before. There's no pro Greek translations that I know of because I looked mm -hmm. at like a variant thing. Um, I'll have to verify that and then post that somewhere so I don't lose that data. But uh, Revelation translate or the ESV tra translates Revelation incorrectly. 13.8 says, all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose names has not been written before the foundation of the world. So that at least they get the preposition right. They're, they're ascribing this prepositional phrase to the names not written. So the ESV does that well. Uh, but then it goes on to say, in the book of the life of the lamb who was slain. So th what they don't do well is they translate since Apo, they translate it as before, but they do ascribe the right preposition to the right object of that preposition. Which is a major error. Like, I mean, in my illustration earlier about the whole 130 thing, changing before to from or vice versa completely changes the meaning of what you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here's uh, Craig Fisher. He says, from, away, it's uh, usage, from or away from. That, that's the oppo. Is, it, is this your da, Chris? Is this your da? It's, yes, it's my dad. <laughs> he, he figured out how YouTube works, apparently. So <laughs> I, I'm, very, I'm very proud of him. Very proud. I watched, a, I watched an Irish movie last night. Uh, it's a good flick. It's called Bad Day for the Cut. You should watch it. Um, and, he, and he talked about ma and da. Instead of you know, <laughs> mom and dad or whatever. So, Ray or uh, Irish. I'm I'm super racist against the Irish, so I might have to skip that. No, I just <laughs> I just made that up. I don't uh, hold any opinions about Irish people. <laughs> it says here that uh, this is a wrap up uh, of the Lamb, and so the Lamb uh, is referred to as slain before the foundation of the world. 
uh, and the book also of life has been, uh, and then its contents have been there from the uh, foundation. Uh, so to me, that would even strengthen my point, because not only was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, but the names written in the, the Lamb's book of well, life Duffy doesn't were there the on this, of the world, before on the, the foundation of the world. So Will Duffy doesn't press that it says oppo, it's sense, and it's not before at all. And the, mm -hmm. what I would have done, I, I raised my hand to talk. I didn't want to interrupt because I was kind of crashing their party anyways. But I would have uh, forced him to uh, say, what preposition is being used there for before? And then yeah, he, he doesn't know Greek. So when he says he has the Greek in front of him, probably means he just has some sort of like strong yeah, concordant or... numbers. And uh, he hasn't looked into the words. And, and it's just a talking point to say, oh, I got the Greek and the Greek agrees with me. I think you point this out on, on uh, your, your debate review where these people who don't know how language works, uh, yeah. they, they try to use it as a bludgeoning tool against people. And, and sometimes it's effective because sometimes they, they, people hear the, oh, you said the Hebrew word. Oh, you must be familiar with Hebrew. If, if you had access to the Hebrew, if you truly understood uh, the grammatical syntax of the Greek, you would have the true meaning of this, this, this verse. And that's, just not, that's not how language works at all. Yeah, I call it. I call this practice. It happens in a lot of different ways. It's like Christian esotericism, where people will feel like they have this particular like piece of knowledge that just elucidates things in a way that you just can't understand unless you unless you knew this Greek word like I do. You you would just see that plan. The word plan that just means immutable pre creation divine decree in the Hebrew. Didn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I don't know if you ever heard the story of me dealing with David Paulbin about Acts thirteen forty eight where where the, the, there's people and there's appointed to eternal life and uh, he had this big paper on it and someone asked me a question or something so I elucidated on my point in which the people are appointing themselves because prior to this in in a couple verses before there's a reflexive usage of the verb where the Jews determine themselves unworthy of eternal eternal life. And then mm -hmm. later on, then there's an appointment of the Gentiles to eternal life. So who's doing the appointing? It makes the most sense, and it makes sense grammatically because the middle and passive are the same Greek form that the people are appointing themselves to eternal life. And he said, oh, no, the Greek doesn't say that. Here's a list of scholars, and he lists them out because I asked him for a list or something. Here's a, a list of Greek scholars that disagree with you. So I went through them one by one to see if they, number one, actually disagree with me, and number two, if if uh, what their reasons are, right? And uh, the first guy I pulled up, he just laughingly dismiss it, dismisses it. Oh, of course they're not appointing themselves. That would be silly. And that's his his refutation of that. And then the next guy points to scholars who actually make my case. So so in him providing a list of names that uh, of people who disagree with me on this, I I was able to compile a list of scholars who agree with my position on this. <laughs> it's like and the knowledge of the Greek is not helpful here to you, your position, because there's plenty of scholars who agree with me. If we want to have a scholar fishing tournament, whoever pulls out the most scholars, we could do that. It's it's like I might not be a scholar, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> uh. I love I love Chris's exasperated okay. voice. My favorite part about the show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I've had this discussion with a lot of people, and and again, no one's ever been able to explain to me what it means that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world if he was actually slain two thousand years ago. <laughs> it's so easy, though. Oh, is it's it? so easy. I mean, I category to me category. that no one can explain it because there's presuppositions that get in the way, and I say that respectfully because the a person uh, that believes the way that. Uh, uh, traditional Christian theists believe that says to us immediately, hey, God had this plan before the foundation of the world that his only begotten son uh, uh, would shed his precious blood for his people. It just seems extremely obvious to us. So I would, I don't think that's that difficult to grasp. Maybe disagree, but the idea that uh, did he understand this question 2,000 years ago just makes it very, very no. hard to understand. Okay, so, so Will Duffy said, no one's been able to explain to me what it means that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. And then the guy said, it's really easy to do that. Did did anyone hear the explanation? Well, he said he said it's really easy to do that. And then he talked about God planning the crucifixion before the foundation of the world, 
not him having been slain before the foundation of the world, which is what Will was getting at. Yeah, and I, Will points that out. We'll, we'll watch Will's response here. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that that uh, necessarily follows. Can Next, I ask well, can I yeah, just ask ahead. a practical question, just real, a clarifying question uh, about this text? It, for both of you guys, I know Mike would say that this is, well, I think Mike would say this is future. Will, is this future for you? Is this uh, Revelation 13? Has that already happened? Uh, it's definitely future. And I, and I, and I, can we come back to that? Can I just put a bow yeah. on this with what Mike? And so I start screen sharing this so that Will Duffy could have direct access to the Revelation 17, 8 text. And in order to ask them what the preposition from the foundation of the world refers to, uh, he he didn't he didn't pick up on that he didn't seem to I don't know if he saw my screen sharing so it might have not flagged in his mind to do so but that, what we're watching right here is me screen sharing on their channel during this conversation yeah exactly. let, yeah let's come back to that so Mike Mike I, I'm just trying to I'm just hoping we can be honest with each other and <laughs> oh. you know, logical you are claiming that what it says is not what happened. You're claiming it says that he was slain before the foundation of the world, which I think absolutely doesn't have to say that. And then you're saying, well, it means that it was planned before the foundation of the world. Well, it could have said it was planned before the foundation of the world. I think we should all agree that, that Christ was not slain before the foundation of the world. And by the way, I actually think the cross was planned before the foundation of the world. We're in agreement there, but this verse doesn't have to say that. Well, the verse doesn't have to say that, uh, and that's I think that's <laughs> a really big text. issue in these kind of discussions. Is we could always, uh, for instance, proffer something that the, that the scripture could have said instead. But I, I don't like to do that. I like to take scripture as it, as it is. But to me, and I, so it's it's this uh, holier than thou claim. It's like I take the whole scripture. So yes, of course, the the text that I use to prove my point doesn't actually say the thing that I'm trying to prove. But I look at the whole scripture. You fail to do that. I'm the one in the conversation looking at everything and all the verses that I say work with my system. Um, but you know, you can't do the same thing as me. I know, I, I know this, this is their claim. I know none of my proof texts say anything about what I'm trying to prove, but just trust me all put together that, that all those data points together absolutely mean my position. <laughs> Yeah, there's no, it's it's like the pre-creation immutable divine decree. I so want to do that debate again because it's just an untenable position and it, there there's no clear passages that teaches that whatsoever. You have to take this passage, this passage, this passage, and this passage and then put them together and go, haha, see? And then yes. you're left trying to, you know, talk about all these various different things and kind of knock them down. But my rule of thumb is that if someone's building an argument and they have like one step of logic... Um, then they're already just making it up. If they have to say, oh, this verse says this, and then this verse over here says this, and then you add them together. By the time you add them together, whatever they're making a claim about is just totally fabricated. It's, it's not a biblical position. Hey, uh, I mean this with all due respect. That is possibly one of the weakest objections I've ever heard. That uh, because the words say the lamb was slain before the found the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, to say that every word that's written in Scripture must be taken wouldn'tly literally. I'm yeah. So that this this is your proof text. So that, that's one thing I always point out. You're the one who introduced this proof text to prove your point, and now you're admitting that it doesn't prove your point. That there, there's a huge problem. The, the fact is, if this is your first proof text you bring out, and of course their first proof text they actually brought out was Balaam, Balaam's opinions about God. Um, if the first proof text you bring out has nothing to do with your position, you got no proof text. None of the verses that you can possibly add to this is going to argue your position. It's just not going to happen. I mean, are we to believe that we must actually uh, partake of Jesus' flesh? Are we to believe that he is uh, 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 He is water, he's the living waters? Of course not. We understand uh, uh, the way that uh, there's so many forms of speech. Bigger just <laughs> Warren, you're, you got... It's, it, it, I mean, you, now, now we're getting into, you, you have to take my understanding of this uh, passage or else slippery slope, Everything else is now in question. Here, here's what you're witnessing, though, in real time. Cognitive dissonance. It, it's basically, if my understanding of this passage is wrong, then I could be wrong about other things. Yes, yes, you could. That is, that is valid. Um, that is not an argument or a defense. You, you could be wrong about your understanding of these other things. You may not be wrong about these other things, but you could. 
So let's not go down that slippery slope. Let's stay here and address this passage. But the problem is, is it's that that fear and that revulsion of going, well, what if I'm wrong here? Oh my goodness, I could be wrong in other places. Well, Christian maturity, right, is saying, you know, I'm probably I'm probably wrong in some areas, and and I, I I'll, I'm willing to consider that. So, and so here, let's put this together, and perhaps I'm wrong in this area, and I'll consider it. Or perhaps you're wrong in this area, and we'll work through this as iron sharpening iron. But the fear is, oh my gosh, I, I can't let go of this interpretation. My whole system unravels. And that's, so, that's what we're listening to. What I heard, this is my take on his argument. His argument is, uh, did you know that language is sometimes used idiomatically? Therefore, this text idiomatically means my position and not yours <laughs> did you know that figures of, of, of speech exist this is my proof text Ta-da! If, if you just <laughs> if you just agree with me that figures of speech exist um then this this text is a figure of speech meaning my theology <laughs> oh man That's speech in the greek but i don't see that we have to take this woodenly literally this must mean that temporally before the world was ever uh, before the foundation of the universe, the lamb must have been slain. Uh, because if we apply that principle, to- so I, I I do like to um, what they oh they, what they do is they turn to Jeremiah and the guy asks Will Duffy in in the context of Jeremiah being known from the womb, he asks uh, in the in that passage God touches Jeremiah with his hand, is that literal? And Will Duffy does has says the correct response. He says I don't know. It could be literal. There could be a touching with the hand, or it could be figurative, and that's not the response that they were expecting. And so that that is a great response. So in the text in which God is described as having hands, you can't just jump to the conclusion that that text is not describing God as having hands. Having hands is an option for that text. It might not be the best option or the most straightforward option, but it should at least be an option. We shouldn't just discount it because we don't like the idea of implications. <laughs> it's like you can't hold that view because implications. Well, and I was just thought thought experimenting this probably a few months ago. I think you must have mentioned something about hands a while ago and how people will say, well, God's not physical, so he can't have hands, yada, yada. But like con- conceptually, is it possible that God is omnipresent and he has hands and that his hands are somehow also omnipresent, but then giving a particular attention to a particular thing? Like, is that... I mean, yeah. I don't know how God works. Like, that's possible, right? Like, why what about, is that such a... What about the time in Genesis 22 where he eats food? I, I assume he used hands <laughs> of some sort. I don't know. I, that yeah. He could have teleported it, uh, the food up to his mouth. He could have been like an armless guy. I would, I'd hope... I'd hope the text would mention that if he showed up without arms and then the food just <laughs> levitated to his mouth to eat. Well, and to back back to this back to the Revelation 17 thing though, that what is what is his point? Because he because they're talking about does God know the future, right? And so his point was to say that names were written before the foundation of the world, therefore no, he knows the future. But then this passage is like, obviously Christ wasn't slain before the foundation of the world. And this is a parallel passage. So I don't, it seems like he's abandoning his proof text while still trying to say that it. Yeah. So his proof text, uh, the Calvinist guy is since the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, but he just abandoned like, that idea, right? He just said, yeah, oh, he, well, it doesn't have to be literally. So then you know, he, he clearly abandoned it as literal, even though he started approaching it as literal. Will Duffy started arguing that this literally means the things that it says. And to maintain his position, the Calvinist position, the Calvinist decides to say, oh, the words aren't literal. This mm-hmm. really means my position. We can't take the words literally. But that's the point, though, is that his original point was that it's literal, and that's why it means my position. But now it's not literal, but it still means my position. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a funny development. <laughs> I I think he's never been pressed on this in his life, and we're seeing a real time reaction to trying to deal with things he's never considered. And so he panics. It goes into this full panic mode where it's like, oh, it's idiomatic. And also, did you know that the rest of scripture? They they kind of add together with this to me my view. It's out. It, you try to pin them down on one verse to make one verse actually a proof text for their position, and they'll say they'll they'll, they'll want to talk about different verses. 
they don't want to talk about the verses that they bring up. It, it's a it's a constant in conversation with these people. Whack them all with proof texts. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's funny. It's so funny. So the rest of scripture, I might as well See, toss the rest of the trash. I won't be able to understand any of it because there is so many figures of speech that are employed. Okay, well, if we're, it sounds like we're in agreement. If you think that it does not mean he was slain before the foundation of the world, it merely means that it was a plan. We're in full agreement. And just a final comment on your Book of Life comment. Uh, I actually think that the Book of Life is evidence of open theism because we see that names are erased in the yeah. Bible, a.k.a. being blotted out of the Book of Life. Tyler, so, back to you. All right, so I want to... They don't respond to it. The last thing that I would say really quickly that is that uh, in agreement in the sense that it didn't happen temporarily there, but as uh, as far as how we translate it, uh, of course, I believe that that meant it was going to happen no matter what, no matter what anyone did, and the exact players and actors were going to do what they did. But I would say, though, that that might be somewhat of a unique position because I've heard several open theists uh, recently as I was preparing for this who would not say the same thing, that it was a guarantee from, from all time... Uh, uh, from the beginning that, that Christ would one day be crucified. That Indeed, there might have been other possibilities, and I've heard it said that uh, it was a point in time when it was decided because this and that happened. So certainly, uh, I, I don't know what percentage of open theists would agree with the, uh, with you then, Will, that you agree that you know Christ was to be slain, uh, and that was agreed upon. And, and, and So uh, this is another thing you'll see in debates, is uh, that Calvinist is not actually debating you. They really want to debate someone else that doesn't exist in the debate. And so they'll have to make up positions, and they want you to defend positions that you didn't take publicly. It's like, does Will Duffy have to present, uh, defend these other open theists who think that the cross needs to be subverted? I, I don't. There's there's no particular reason why. And the guy doesn't he doesn't seem to pause long enough to hear Will Duffy's opinion on that because Will Duffy and him both agreed that God has plans. But then there's a further question which he doesn't consider because his worldview precludes it, so it's not even an option in his mind that God can change his plans. And yeah, I mean, I I I take a, a particular view of this that that's you know probably different than Will's. Um, I think that uh, God knew uh, the crucifixion of Christ as an option in that in that realm of possibility, but not an epistemologically certain because it wasn't yet necessary. Yeah. And so, uh, my understanding of that is that it was declared in response to Adam's sin when it became epistemologically certain or necessary. And then God said, because of this, I'm doing this. That's a response, right? Uh, because of your sin, uh, Genesis 3.15, he's talking about the proto evangelum And so from that point on, it's now a decree that God in his good honor, his good character has committed to bringing to pass. And, uh, and so people say, well, you think that Christ was plan B? No, Christ was always plan A. But how God got to the crucifixion, that was plan B because obedience is better than sacrifice. And so we can we can we can actually see the dynamic uh, workings of God where he's working all things together for good. And you don't have to sit back and go, well, in eternity, God decreed sin so he could kill Jesus and get maximal glory. There's there's a lot of nuance there. Um, and, you know, and, and so I have a particular view on that. I know some guys will say God always knew. Um, it was a possibility. Some will say he decreed it. But my family just got home, and they're very loud. So I'm going to mute the mic, and I'm going to take myself out of the stream. I love you guys. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks. Good to see you, Warren. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Elsa has a whole chapter in his book. Um, what, what are ways that uh, Christ could still be crucified? Maybe it doesn't have to involve Pilate or the Romans. Maybe it's a situation like Isaac in which... Isaac seems to willingly give himself up uh, as some sort of sacrifice, like a temple sacrifice. Maybe Jesus is brought up uh, to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and sacrificed as the yearly sacrificial lamb. Those things are possible, and the crucifixion, it wouldn't be a crucifixion, uh, and the, the sacrifice could still happen, something like that. Those are possibilities. It's, it's not like this metaphysical certainty. If God has a plan to redeem the world, through Jesus, does that doesn't mean that all 
Roman soldier coughs are, are predestined from time eternal. <laughs> Anything like if that. If one They're... cough, if God's not in control of that one cough, that one cough could disrupt his plan, R.C. Sproul said. Yeah. That one cough. <laughs> it's it's not as if God has... That one rogue almost, molecule. One rogue molecule. And it's not as if God has an infinite amount of uh, opportunities and innovative ways to get his plans done. It can't be that. It must be he, that he controls all things, every molecule. Decreed before the foundation of the world. All right, I've got a couple questions, and then I want to ask if anybody from the community has got any questions. Uh, feel free to jump in. We've got about 20 minutes left. It's not clear so how this community question thing out. actually uh, operated. First, I want to go back to Jeremiah 1 and just read it. So the Lord's message came to me. I'm starting verse 4. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you So apart. here's the hand I thing. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. I answered, O oh, sovereign Lord, really, I do not know how to speak well enough for that, for I'm too young. The Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young, but go to whomever I send you and say whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of those whom I send you, for I will be with you to protect you, says the Lord. Then verse 9 says, then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I will most assuredly give you the words you are to speak for me. Will, is verse 9 literal or is that metaphorical? Did, did God actually reach out his literal hand and touch Jeremiah on the mouth? Or is this a figure of speech explaining something? Uh, sorry, I was not expecting that question. Let me pull it up really fast. Nobody uh, Jeremiah one Jeremiah one nine. One nine, yes, sir. This is this is the uh, Tyler Vela tactic. This is the attacking your hermeneutic. Are you being consistent? That has nothing to do with the debate question. It's just trying to say, well, you're not being consistent here, therefore you're wrong. <laughs> ah, yeah, Tyler Vail. I'm glad he's blocked me, except I don't have to ever deal with his face. It's fantastic. Um, but uh, in Jeremiah 1, you have a verse in verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, then you have all the text, and then you have in one nine. then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And so Michael Heiser has some work on the word of the Lord, which he identifies with the Logos as talked about in the book of John. The word was with God and the word was God. And you have the word of the Lord appearing to prophets throughout the Bible. And his contention is that like this is a physical appearance of like a Christ-like figure, that there's a physical entity coming, and that's what it means by the word. And so that's a very interesting contention. So if if uh, Heiser is right about this, then this is a physical manifestation of the Lord, of Yahweh. This might be a divine fragment or something like that, something like that. And uh, with a body and very possibly, Jeremiah 1.9, this phys physical entity is putting forth his hand and touching Jeremiah's mouth. I, I, think that, I think that is actually the best explanation about what's going on here is that the Lord has a physical entity interacting with Jeremiah. And that's that's what's being referred to as the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is not like a prophetic thing that just comes in, in a language format. It's an actual entity. As we see time and time in the Bible where this word of the Lord has what seems like physical properties. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. So uh, Michael Heiser might, that... might be correct here. Uh, yeah. And, and if, and it would totally undermine the point that these guys are getting at. And Will Duffy's not, he's not like the most up to date on ancient Near East scholarship to be able to probably make this point. So I think he does pretty good in pointing out that it, the text could go either way. The text allows for a physical option and a non physical option. And, the, and then are they going to clutch their pearls and be like, huh, you mean this could be literal? Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Is that, let's wait and see. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I don't hear. I don't have any sound. Uh, no, I. Yeah, there goes. they're they're pausing. You don't yeah. know if I you think speak. It, I no no I I I don't know if it's uh, if it was a physical touching or not. See, there we go. And but I'm asking again, you. I, I hate uh, to do this, but does this show that God knows the future? Oh no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I like the that. question is, you're taking verse five literally. I'm asking in verse nine that it, are you? Being it's your proof text. Are you going to take this literally it's as your well? Proof text, or guy. is Jeremiah trying to explain something? When you have to argue that your proof text is not literal, I, you've lost the debate. 
it's it's so funny people are like okay god's eyes are on the ways of the good and the wicked therefore god knows everything i like well that's that's a received knowledge is god gaining information from his eyes and they say oh you can't take it literally okay so you, this is your proof text uh, so <laughs> so you have to deny the little little reading of your own proof text and then it is, is somehow especially magically means your theology and not mine okay i got it that that that's how we're doing this Use them. So if you use a proof text, hopefully your proof text at least makes your position. I just throwing that out there. Maybe your proof text that should would be actually... reasonable. That would be a reasonable <laughs> expectation. <laughs> a language that we can all understand as a metaphor or figure of speech, even. That's well, the verse point that I'm trying to five, make. Verse five is uh, is quoting God, and it ends in verse five, and then verse nine is written by Jeremiah. So. I, Again, we're, we're going to see we're going to see figures of speech, and 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 the next verse there's not one, and the next verse there is one, so that's common throughout the Bible. But again, I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you, I think it's possible it was physical yeah, that's touching, good. and it's possible that it was not. I don't know. Why are you so sure then about verse five that this is before Jeremiah entered the the womb that you're taking that <laughs> literal, right? But but you don't know in verse nine. Yeah. So here's the implicit argument. If, it, if you don't take verse 9 literally, that uh, God is putting out his a physical hand and touching Jeremiah, then you should agree with whatever interpretation we have of the previous verse and not any alternative. And, that, a debate and a debate tactic would be good to point that out. Like, so what you're saying is, and then just say that and then be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? like walk me through this. I, I'd always point out this is your proof text. If your proof text doesn't on the face value make the case that you're claiming, it's not a proof text. It doesn't prove your position and and prove I'm false. Saying that Jeremiah one five is figurative doesn't mean that I'm wrong and you're right. It could be figurative for all sorts of things. You're just saying that now we should ignore your own proof text. Great, uh, let's ignore your proof text. I'm all for that. I, they're, they're playing. They're 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 just silent, trying to figure it out. This isn't well, our dead air, guys. This is theirs. <laughs> Will Duffy's it just seems inconsistent to me. So yeah, what? well, again, I I I didn't study verse nine to prepare for this, so I apologize. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, so and I and I, I so that that that's that is kind of a failing. So if you're going. To, well, I, I guess it's not his proof text, and so he shouldn't have necessarily studied it. But if you know people are going to be pulling up proof texts, try to get, understand the context of the verses that they are going to turn to so that you actually understand what's happening in that so you don't run into this situation where it's like, oh, I didn't actually really study this. And then you can point out very funny things like uh, the fact that they don't know who they're quoting if they're quoting numbers. That is That is hilarious. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever done that. If someone quoted numbers, that's, a, that's one of my favorite uh, tropes that I learned from you, Chris. Was uh, who's speaking in Numbers twenty three? Who's that talking there? What? Oh, oh a false prophet. Okay, I got you. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Balaam. Yeah, he definitely he's, he's got immutable truth, Balaam, of course, and we should listen to anything he says about anything. I don't know. So it's funny, and it just illustrates that they don't know their the context of the things that they're quoting. So. Get familiar with their arguments. Get familiar with the context of their arguments. And uh, I think Will Duffy handles this correctly in saying it could go either way. Oh, and play. Uh-oh, I've frozen. Uh-oh. Oh, no. I've... Oh, it's 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 unfrozen. Okay. Wait, I'm glad you read okay. the second half of verse 5, which says, Before you were born, I sanctified you. So right. clearly the context of that... Uh, of that verse is life in utero yeah and so i agree that jeremiah was chosen in the womb so that's an interesting thing that will duffy points out in verse five before i formed you in the womb i knew you before you were born i consecrated you i appointed you a prophet to the nation so that seems to be like a reiteration of the same point in two or three different ways and so this the idea the holistic idea that this verse is talking about is you, I, I picked you from the womb for the specific purpose. And I think Will Duffy goes on to point out that it doesn't always work to God's advantage in the Bible when God picks people. And 
Uh, what's his example that he uses? Uh, he uses actual Saul because uh, that's actually a really good example because that's one of the two things that God describes as his own regrets within the Bible. Hmm. He was not chosen before the foundation of the world. He was not known before the foundation of the world. Of course, other examples would be Jonah, who's like, I don't want to do this. And he runs away. Then God has to capture him with a big fish and then put him on course. It's like, that's that's not divine determinism. That's, that's God having to go through extraordinary <laughs> methods to get us. We, we see practically how God works things out. Um, then also Moses. And Moses like, I don't want to go talk to Pharaoh. I'm, not, I'm a really bad speaker. And then and God's like, who made man's mouth? And Moses is like, I'm not buying it. I don't want to do this. It's like, fine, I'm sending Aaron instead, changing my plans. But and so it's funny because because with the whole Jonah thing, determinism, like all of that, the big fish, him being thrown overboard, stuff like that, it's just frivolities. Like yeah. if God can combat compatibilistically predetermine Jonah to do anything that he wants him to do, why doesn't he just, why isn't there something clear in that passage that uh or or not in that passage but any passage that talks about some kind of inner changing turn to get somebody to compatibilistically do this there just isn't like it just doesn't it's just a bunch of frivolities like you know even paul's blinding light like what why what are you doing jesus just just regenerate him it's like, like bad yeah. bad fan fiction <laughs> <laughs> God, the, the whole reality I, I like pointing out absurd stories where I don't know some guy in a bar gets stabbed because he farts or something like that it's like God programmed that into this world is, is what <laughs> who's writing the story what why why and that verse does not establish that God knows the future nor does it establish he knows the entire future it just establishes he knew Jeremiah before he was born. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Could I, could I, All right, Mike, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Mike. No, I've been, that brings up that brings up new questions for me then. And let's just put aside and forget whether this meant uh, what it seems to mean to me, uh, whether he knew Jeremiah beforehand. But this brings up for me an interesting parallel because he tells Jeremiah here before I formed you in the womb, and he tells us what he had appointed him to do. And it kind yeah. of it, to me, I'm reminded of this in Galatians 1:15 when Paul says that God set me apart from my mother's womb. Come on, I guess my Duffy. question. I think this will really out. shine a light on exactly what our opinions are of God. Uh, but I would ask Will. So obviously, he had God had plans for these men uh, before they were born. So. I mean, was he just hoping that they would turn out to be some of two of his greatest servants? I mean, what, what, did he just have his hopes up? But they could have said, you know what, I want nothing to do with you. And and so then his work would have been. So the correct response is always turn back to the Bible and point a biblical answer. Because if you just start um, going off on saying, well, this could happen and then this could happen, then they're going to start dealing with the concepts you're proposing rather and then they're not going to focus on the bible anymore get them well, to argue with jesus or argue with the scriptures yeah themselves. it's like yeah. You're, you're not arguing with uh me that it, the cross can be subverted you're arguing with jesus because jesus she says that he could he could subvert it with the legion of angels if he so wanted so it's not my opinion it's jesus and then they have to argue with jesus it's the, it's the funniest thing they they don't know how to interact with these things um if if you if you know what you're doing if you refocus the bible each time because every time they want to go off on one of these tangents about your own beliefs, then they get another proof text against their position that they're just adding to the huge list of proof texts already against their position. It is so funny. For nothing. Uh, okay, great question, Mike. <laughs> Here's my response. Uh, yes, uh, God chose certain men uh, while they were in the womb, um, and he had plans for them. What we find biblically is yeah. that when God chooses someone and has plans for them, it doesn't always work out. And so Israel, Israel we, have, we have great examples yeah. where it did work out, which I think is great. But we also have examples where it did not work out. And again, I think that's evidence of open theism. So I like how he points that out. Um, it's, it's not surprising to open theists when God's plans work out. That's you know, less than notable. It's like, yeah, we, we agree. God can, we think God's powerful and God can do things. It's not, it's not like a huge blow to our beliefs, but what's of particular interest is the times that it doesn't turn out. It's not typical, but sometimes it does in fact happen. And he points out a tangible example that they could talk about, which is, I, I think he handles that perfectly. I want to just 
I have to go to Romans 8 at this point because, Will, we're talking about salvation here, right? And and so See, they, they want to talk about I didn't salvation. know we were talking about salvation. And when did look, that happen? Ah. So, Mike, do you want to do you want to answer that or in the in the in the grand scheme here? Because the the mission at, at, at CSC is always right not back. just to talk about the topic. And now we're low on time, and so we're coming. Obviously, I think you would admit, Will, from the more traditional Orthodox Christian position. And so for us, it's a salvation issue. And Tyler always likes to make that clear at least once, regardless of what the topic is. Right. That's God's ultimate plan: is to save a chosen people. That whenever you said that some of God's plans don't always work out with the people that He chooses. Not in regards to salvation, though, like God saves whom God shows mercy on whom he desires to show mercy, right? Oh, I apologize, then, Todd, because I thought you were saying that, hey, this is this topic that we're discussing is a salvation issue. And uh, so, no, I completely misread you there. But, yeah, I would agree with you then in that regard, Tyler. Ultimately, well, it is. Before, yeah, go ahead. Let me just, let me just ahead, give you guys an example of what I was make saying. Make sure that I get the chance. Go ahead, Sorry, Will. I'm on a little delay here, so. I was referring to, uh, here's an example. I was referring to, to uh, like when God chose Saul to be king and later regretted that decision. Okay. okay. And God actually says that he had planned on and would have um, g given Saul okay. the throne forever. Got you. So God came to basically, and correct this if this is wrong, but God came to a fork in the road. He had a decision to go with Saul or David. He saw what Saul was going to do. So notice, notice the reframing. So he's going to try to reframe Will Duffy's argument into something that's more conducive to his own position. God comes to this fork in the road and he has to make a decision. And so I think Will Duffy deflates this pretty quickly. I think Will Duffy does what's right. And he chose David instead because God learned that Saul, or, or well, we know what Saul did to you know for god to rip the kingdom from him but is that what you're saying well just so our listeners have a clear you know perspective where you're coming from god comes to a fork in the road with saul and david he sees that saul will do is just or he's seen that saul is just not going to work out and he chooses david is that what you're saying no what i'm saying okay. all i'm doing <laughs> is quoting scripture so first samuel 13 and first samuel 15 state what god's in so if I, if I remember correctly, that uh, the end of I might have to Samuel... roll in a second, by the way. I'll let you know. Yeah. Uh, baby, baby girl might be waking up. So <laughs> Good times. Uh, babies are great. So yeah. uh, she's... Nap time. Is she one yet? Is she one years old yet? She is... Well, it depends on how you count. She's a micro preemie. So she's about, I think, 14 months or so from when she was actually born. But her due date wasn't until july she's born in march and her due date wasn't until july so she'll be like corrected one year old here in just a couple weeks okay so, so is she crawling yet walking walking yet? no oh. micro preemies are real delayed like they have a lot of developmental delays and stuff and she's got like a, a g tube a feeding tube and stuff so she can't like have tummy time and stuff to even practice kind of getting up on oh no her hands that's, and stuff so that's, that's so, heartbreaking yeah, yeah. oh yeah, she's doing she's doing all right, all things considered. Though she she's, looks she's like a happy a baby. Road, yeah, she's sweet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she just always makes me good, smile. Good baby, good innocent baby. <laughs> uh not not one of those evil babies. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that baby crying because it's hungry. So uh, evil. <laughs> he 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 wants to hang out with his mom. Oh, what an evil per He would probably just kill her. He'd probably just murder her <laughs> if he had like a gun. <laughs> and it's some ammo. And if he knew how to operate the trigger, he'd point it at her and, and shoot the mom. That's definitely what he would do. <laughs> ah, it's so funny. Uh, so, so Craig Fisher points out that in Romans, you know, um, we're talking about real quickly the chosen people of Israel. Chosen people were elect. That's the word used, elect. And these people are enemies of the gospel. So God elects a bunch of people and they turn out to be enemies of the gospel. And it's almost and his, like, carry on. It's almost like that when Jesus describes election and it describes it like a banquet in which you you try to get a bunch of people and then they refuse, and so then you grab a different group and they come, but then some come in the incorrect manner. It's it's almost like the elect people, you know, uh, aren't aren't assured. They're they're not something that God is meticulously decreeing. And they could resist him to the effect that they don't accept the invitation or accept God's invitation incorrectly. 
Many and, are called, but few are chosen. That's elect. And his claim here was that uh, God's plan has always been to chose a sp to save a particular chosen people. And my comment that I think Craig, you know, is also responding to that line of thinking was that God chose Israel like, and obviously not all of them were saved. So it's just this, this vocabulary of elect just means this particular thing. And one thing that Eric and I said in an episode was that, can we just do away with the word elect and elect? It's just choose the doctrine of choosing God chooses things. So there, there's an entire book about this. It's called Deleting Elect from the Bible. It's by Jackie Moore, who's a guy from England. And if you Google his name, oh, it is, if I was ever in a debate with a Calvinist, uh, I would get this guy and I'd put him on my team. Because if you listen to him talk, you'll fall asleep within like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I could rob the team that uh, the Calvinist team. I could go over to their booth and pull their wallets out and take all their money um, because it's, it's coma inducing, but he's, he's a good guy. <laughs> he wrote an entire book that goes through every use of elect in the Bible and uh, how it just means something like, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, something that's fine or refined or something that's, uh, like you get the elect grapes to make your wine. You pick the elect stones to build your bridges elect just means like quality you know th these are quality people choice if you will <laughs> choice yeah choice you know, like uh makers mark i don't know if it's like walmart or sam's club they have like uh members select or members choice type of branding that's that's what it is it's it's not it's not this uh calvinist hijacked language where where god is just choosing people independent of anything about those people from all eternity to meticulously turn them into robot slaves of him. All right. I I'll see run. you later. Thanks for Good coming. Chat. It was fun. All right. We're going to hit play. Word for Saul. And then they tell us that God regretted setting up Saul as king. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying God had plans for Saul and then ended, they ended up not working out and God regretted that he did that. My question, so I'm glad you brought up for Samuel. First Samuel 15, 29 says, and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent for he is not a man that he should relent. So I think Will Duffy drops the ball a little bit in that he could have easily got his, uh, his, uh, his uh, critics to agree to general principles of reading scripture. When we're reading the Bible, we prioritize what? what the narrator says and what God says, like God's words are probably going to be first in, in uh, the list of things that we take as authoritative. And then maybe under, under God, there's the narrator and under the narrator, there's probably people that the Bible values and like the lowest tier of claims about God are from people who, who hate God or God's enemies. Uh, someone likes Job's wife who says, curse God and die. We probably shouldn't like prioritize her views about God or Job's friends who are criticized, uh, they should probably not be towards the top. They should probably be the bottom of the list of the hierarchy. And so Will Duffy could have got them to agree to that principle and then ask them who's talking in their proof text. Because what they want to do is they want to prioritize the words of Balaam. They want to prioritize the words of Samuel over the words of the narrator at the end of the verse, at the end of the chapter, and they want to prioritize them over the words of God earlier in that chapter. So they're overriding God. They're overriding the narr narrator with a character in the text. So this, this way of reading the Bible is completely backwards. And the only reason they're adopting this strategy is because they really are desperate for a proof text. And Will Duffy points out that context limits those statements. And he actually reads it to them, which is really funny. And they, they don't seem to internalize his point. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into what you just said? This is the point that I was trying to make in the beginning whenever I quoted Numbers 23. It says the exact sure. same thing. So how sure. is the, and I don't know any other way to put it than this, but how is the God that you're describing different from man in that sense? Sure. So Tyler, it's unfortunate to me that that exact Hebrew word there, which actually does not mean relent. That's a bad translation. It means that's the, NK, that's the New King James Version. Yeah, correct. It's a it's that word is is translated wrong. It's the Hebrew word naham, which means repent. I mean, you could translate it relent, but the yeah. Bible attributes that word, that Hebrew word, to God over two dozen times. 
it says that God does not repent twice. Numbers 23 and 1 Samuel 15. Interestingly enough, in the, context of first, in the context of 1 Samuel 15, it says God repents twice. And in the middle, it says he does not repent. This is very simple. I, I think, honestly, I, I've actually taught my kids this and they get it. When we see a verse. And this is actually a really good strategy, pointing out that his kids understand the concept he's about to explain. So then it... Uh, it frames his point as very elementary that they should understand. And when they fail to understand his point or internalize his point, it's basically like, my kids are smarter than you. So it, it's good framing set up for what's going to happen. Verse that says God repents, he's repenting for something specifically. When we see a verse that says God does not repent, he's not repenting of something. What, one of the most effective parts of the, the Will Duffy debate with, Matt Slick was when he's trying to ask Matt Slick if God could add one raindrop to one one storm, and uh, uh, Matt Slick he keeps he keeps like pressing off like oh I don't know what you mean there what, I, explain this and and he has to ask the question Will Duffy has to ask the question can God add one raindrop drop to one storm he has to ask it like five times and he says you know what my daughter uh, could understand this question it, it seems like you're just trying to avoid this question. It was a very effective point in the debate to show that Matt Slick didn't care about intellectual honesty and he didn't want to answer the question because it, you know, it wasn't conducive to his point, his side. And Matt Slick is under the, he's one of those individuals who will literally say anything in order to win a debate. It doesn't matter what the thing is he says. It doesn't matter the consistency of the thing. It, what do I need to say to make you believe what I want you to believe? make you do what I want you to do. That, that's his only principle in operating. And these type of tactics point it out. It's great. Something specifically, and to, to put a bow on this, God repented that he set up Saul as king. And then verse 29 is saying he will not repent of taking the throne away from Saul. Uh, Tyler, if I could just interject that. Yeah, yeah, uh, go ahead. Am I to understand, we, we are in agreement here that we're discussing the Hebrew word Nahum, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, because, uh, again, I'm no Hebrew expert, but everything I have read, uh, there is uh, uh, there are several views that scholars assert here. And the majority do not believe that repent, and that's in the, in the English word repent, of course, has several meanings. But they're pretty clear here that that does not mean to repent the same way that... Uh, a man would repent. I don't think very many. So what I would do in response to this is a, uh, I'm pretty sure biblical scholar, Christine Hayes would uh, agree with me here and all sorts of other biblical scholars. So can you name some of your biblical scholars and see if he actually has a list of name because, because this, I think this is a bluff. I think he's bluffing or I think any scholar scholars that he lists is going to be like pundit, like James White, you, if he throws, oh, James White, biblical scholar, thinks it doesn't say that. Well, yeah, uh, he's a pundit. He, he cares very, very deeply about having a certain position and has a very vested interest in ignoring all evidence to the contrary. And so it's, it's not exactly unbiased scholarship. So show us the secular scholars that agree with your position, and I'll show you the secular scholars that agree with mine. Uh, we'll trade and, and see if that works scholars hebrew scholars at all make that uh, assertion okay so number one uh no one stated that it means the same thing as a man repenting of hey, sin i think this is a waste of time so if that's what you are implying no not that but when we hear repent when we hear the word repent since it, 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 it we our mind automatically goes to something that we were never given any indication is something that god actually feels and so it can also mean to to change, you know, to change the heart, the disposition of the heart, uh, change one's mind, change one's purpose. I think to go immediately to the word repent kind of creates an impression. I just want to be sure people listening and not. So the the big problem with that, which Will Duffy doesn't point out, is that we're actually talking about First Samuel 15, and they want to have it as a proof text that God doesn't repent. And the same word is used for God is not a man that he should repent. The exact same word is used in context twice also for God repenting of making Saul king and then God moving on to find someone else for the throne. And so if the same word is used three times within the same context, it probably means the same thing each time. And so if they want this as a proof text that God doesn't repent at all, 
then that word probably retains that meaning on those two other instances. And so this is kind of a red herring going on here. And that could be pointed out that if they want this to be a proof text for their position, then then they're going to have to try to treat the word consistently. But uh, that's that's not pointed out. I understand that uh, most scholars do not at all assert that it means in any way that, that God was just, uh, I don't know, any meaning of repent that I know that would be the well, first um, one thing meaning we would consider. I don't think applies there. Yeah, it, it means it means. Yeah, the last time Will Duffy talked to these guys, uh, this Tyler Fowler guy, he's got this weird beard going wrong. I, I actually offered him. I said on on his uh, channel, I said, "Well, how much how much would it cost to to PayPal you to shave your beard?" He never responded. So uh, yeah, missed opportunity. He could have made a little bit of money to shave that off. That would have been fantastic to turn or to have a change of mind or heart that's what the word means and we have uh biblical examples of men changing their mind and we have biblical examples of god changing his mind and, and we so see my, it, again but, but will but will, hold on but my question <laughs> is there are specific verses that he says that they that he's not like a man you just equated you brought down god to man brother and and, and it like i don't understand how you're not seeing that you're you just said that man changes his mind god changes his mind my question this entire conversation is how is the god you're describing different he's not that's the point that i'm trying to make is that what so it, it's it's a real slight shift it's a real real uh subtle pulling out a different card you, you go to your verse this is what he does and he says this verse says god is not a man that he should repent and then he asks the question that's not related to that meaning of the verse. He assumes that that verse means whatever theology and presuppositions that he has ingrained, and asks Will Duffy subtly, without it's 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 real subtle there, adopt my interpretation of this verse, and then explain how my interpretation of this verse meets your views. What Will Duffy really should do, he should have done originally, is said. That verse is not saying what you think it's saying. It's just not. And then went directly to the context and talks about the context and talked about the meaning in context, saying uh, the presuppositions you're bringing to this verse are just not inherent in that verse. And this subtle shift, you see, you see that, what is it? Uh, he's got some cards up his sleeve. He's, he's shifting the debate to presuppose his own interpretation and forcing Will Duffy to try to uh, deal with his interpretation in his system and and make uh, Will Duffy adopt that interpretation to fit in Will Duffy's interpretation. Will Duffy doesn't do a bad what you job are describing here. is no different than me, is no different than you, is no different than Mike. What is okay, different? So let, me, let me explain. Numbers 23 is the story of Balak and Balaam. So and here's, they, this is good. God is essentially, they're trying to bribe God. So yes, God is not going to be like a man and accept a bribe. In 1 Samuel 15, Saul is trying to get Samuel to get God to change his mind after what he's done. And he tears his robe. Saul tears Samuel's robe. And maybe a man would change his mind at that point. And Samuel says, no, God is not going to repent of taking the throne away from you. So that's real it's good. As simple as that. But the text doesn't say that. He does, it doesn't say <laughs> he's going to take the or he's not going to repent and take the throne away from you. It just says he should not relent or repent. This is great. This is it, great. It, there's none of that. You're adding to the text. You're you're doing what you accused Mike and I of doing just a, just a few minutes ago. Is that you're saying that you're not sticking with the text at this point, and you're adding and bringing different things in? Oh, hold on, like, I didn't. I, I didn't bring anything in. Let me just read verbatim. Oh, uh, that's uh, great. Verse. First that's Samuel great. fifteen twenty eight. So Samuel <laughs> said uh, to him, "The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, it and has given it to a neighbor exactly of yours what who is better than you. And also, the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent." Okay, it's exactly. Oh, uh, the Tyler guy set himself up. He set himself up. He said, "Oh, it's not about that in context. It's like it, it's literally the verse. Yeah, you just have to read the prior verse right before the verse we're talking about. That's literally that's literally the subject of the conversation. That's li literally what's happening. Oh, it's so funny. And then uh, this Tyler Fowler guy is like, "Oh, okay. I see what it says. I didn't make that up." All right, Mike, do you got any um, 
do you have any closing <laughs> remarks? And yeah. I will uh, give it over to Will, and then we'll end. Uh, Idol Killer says this, ignore context, isolate and ex exegete, and accuse your opponent of the same. And so, again, it's, it's, there's a lot of projection going on. Um, when, when you're dealing with these individuals, they, they don't want to be consistent in their methodology for interpreting verses. They, they want to accuse you of their own sins, their own crimes, and they just want to claim that they have the Bible on their side. It's, it's, well, I, I got other podcasts about the, this mentality and maybe one day I need, I need to actually read the, uh, the psychological paper about Calvinists that, that, uh, an anonymous individual sent me that is, appears that they wrote about the mindset and the cult mentality of Calvinism in which it is, it is a controlled bubble world where they, they don't want to accept outside input, where they want to be kept in this certain mindset and they don't want to accept other interpretations, other data sets, other things that might make that bubble collapse. And we do see that here where or they they've ignored everything that Will Duffy has said. They've they've posted all sorts of irrelevant texts, and Will Duffy points that out. And they still maintain that they they're the ones who hold to the truth of the Bible. They presented zero proof texts, zero proof texts that prove what they want to show. Well, uh, my closing remark would be that uh, it is always difficult for any uh, traditional Protestant to debate an open theist. And the reason why is because this, you will notice, is a unique form of exegesis that has been unknown throughout Christian history. I mean, we can go back to Calcidus' uh, commentary on Timothy on his Latin. Calvin, Calvin complained about these open theists. He's like, these darn open theists are running around thinking that God doesn't know the future. So it's it's not new. It's not new. Uh, that's it's, it's pretty relevant, and it's been the layman position since always. The laymen have always believed this. It's only been the intellectuals who write the books, who write the history books. Those are the people who accept the popular philosophy. The layman, Augustine's mom, Augustine's mom, she didn't accept any of this. Um, Augustine thought that Christianity had a physical God until, until Augustine was 30 years old and was introduced to this concept that God might be incorporeal. That's the state of Christianity at the time of Augustine. The, the, the laymen have never accepted uh, these Calvinistic concepts. It's a rewriting of history. Translation of Timothy that you, you may see some ideas that kind of leave it open, but what actually is known as open theism today, uh, they, they go where people before never would go. We would never make assumptions about God. We would never rob uh, uh, certain attributes from him. Uh, and so it's, it can be difficult to just pin it down sometimes. But I would say this. When we read the actions of God, that he repented of this, or he, we must understand that he is so much higher than us that we can never understand him as he is. So he must, uh, in a way, speak so that we can understand what he's saying. He must give us some idea of what he's feeling. When it says that he's angry, is he angry like us? No, not at all. He knew exactly The, the text must happen, mean something else. he has to give us a way that we can understand that. The text secretly means our theology. That, uh, he disapproves of what's happened here. So the last thing I would say is we should not expect, if our view is correct, to find a single verse that says this or that we must translate in a woodenly literal way uh, terms that are used. There is a classic Protestant uh, hermeneutic, and anyone that studies that, I'm confident, uh, will see the form of exegesis we use and just why we do. Will, what are your uh, closing remarks? Yeah, so I, I actually thought we had more time, so um, totally up to you guys. Yeah, apparently this is an hour TV time, show. I'm more than happy to. But it's good that um, they cut it off. Things. Number one, um, I think if someone goes back and listens to this, I don't think they will hear from you guys making a case from the Bible that God knows the future. We talked about a lot of things, but I just don't see that that was there. <laughs> um, I mentioned the complete absent uh the, the Bible's completely absent of all these verses that we would expect to see if God knows the future. Then I gave all of the categories of verses that uh, essentially state that God doesn't know the future. And so I think that from a, from a topical standpoint of, of does the Bible teach that God, that God knows the future, I just don't think that there was a case made for that. And lastly, Mike, I think you made my prediction true. Um, you referred to the Orthodox Christian position. So I like how he's re-summarizing everything, recapping the debate, and making the audience think about who said what and who argued what position. One thing that he seems to do in that um, incorrectly in this recapping is he doesn't 
emphasize that he made a positive case, a strong positive case for God not knowing future events. He didn't emphasize, you know, I have all these verses. There's hundreds of verses. They're out there. We've talked about a few of them. We talked about uh, God repenting of making Saul king, in which God regretted his own decision. He doesn't do something like that, but he should point out to the audience that he did present a positive case, re-emphasize in their mind that he made this positive case, point out that they had no positive case, and all their verses that one would expect, and he, he does do that this part, one of the all the verses that one would expect, if their position was true, they just don't exist. Remember, the Bible is a big book, written over uh, hundreds, a thousand years, uh, written over a long period of time about a huge variety of subjects, different genres, different types of writing, you would expect something rather than nothing if their views were correct. But they, they got nothing. As, as they've shown, they've had to appeal to this amorphous blob of verses that supposedly exist in the ether, which all work together to mean that their system is true and Will Duffy's is false. It, it just doesn't exist. It's it's like fog. You try to, you you see fog, you go over, try to grab the fog, and it just slips through your hand. You can never, you can never grasp so, something solid. It's always moving. Oh, the verse here that I quoted doesn't mean it, but look at all these other verses. You go to those verses, and those verses don't quite say what they say, and you're just, you're just walking around in fog, swinging at fog. You can never pick up anything, but they claim it's there. It's just not there. He referred to Christian history, scholars, and commentaries, and that's what I thought would happen at the beginning is instead of dealing with what does the Bible teach, we deal with what do people, men, great. believe throughout history, and I just think that we need to focus on Scripture. I think we need to have a second uh, part two on this discussion. Um, the, the, just as a reminder for our listeners in the closing remarks, I asked Will to come on to present a positive case for open theism, right? And to, I'm interested to go back to look to see if that was made as well, because there were questions asked that were not answered. There were um, verses that were brought up that Which were ones? not dealt with in Which any ones? way, shape, or form. They were skipped over. They were they Which went ones? to a completely different context. And so, Will, if you see that, I see that as well from your side, my friend. Um, so just to just be consistent on that. But I want to thank you guys, like really thank you guys, because even though these are passionate conversations, even though we end up disagreeing in the end, right? I still think just because we disagree doesn't mean we shouldn't sit back down to discuss this. So if you guys are open to it, I am especially open to it. Um, Will, I want to thank you for coming on for your generosity. Mike, same thing. It's good to have you back as co-host on CSG, brother. Missed you. Love you, man. And for those who want to catch more of CSG, feed.completecenters.com. If you try to go to completecenters.com, it'll be a little bit wacky, a little bit. Um, his podcast is so convoluted to get access to. I had to, I, I couldn't find his podcast on like the direct channel stream that it was said it was going to be on. So that I had to join the conversation directly. So I don't even think I was supposed to be in this conversation. I was just like, hanging out as a lurker uninvited in the middle of this conversation. So um, I, I'm sure it exists somewhere in the internet. I'm not sure how an audience finds it and uh, listens to his podcast, but I, I'm sure it exists there. We're still working on the website. So if you just go feed, F-E-E-D, dot completecenters.com, you can catch all of our episodes. We yeah, will be back I, again. I'm, I've, I'm definitely going to catch more of your, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually catch any more of your episodes, but uh, I think it was interesting. It was an interesting debate and it's interesting in the fact that not everything that they brought up was your typical Calvinist talking points. It is actually pretty funny that their very first proof text is the Balaam proof text. And it, it's it, every single time it, it's, you could you could bet bet money on it. You can make money that that's what their go to proof text is the Balaam one. I I think that they they default to that one rather than the Samuel text because then they understand they don't have to deal with the those bookends those two times where God describes himself repenting and the narrator describes himself repenting and so they like the numbers text better because then they don't have to deal with that and so that's one of the reasons they moved to that numbers text first uh, but they just don't understand. They're, they're trying to get people who don't understand context, not that they understand the context. They just know that it's going to be less of a fight for them if that's what they start with. And it, it's it's a very easy gotcha every single time if you just start asking them basic questions about their own proof text. It's pretty funny. 
so some some new arguments, some interesting arguments. Um, great, great maneuvers on Will Duffy's part on several several occasions. I like how he he talks about the Revelation verse in detail. He talks about oh, what was that other major one that he took them through? He, he talks about Jeremiah. If he he might have went a little bit overboard talking about the phetology section. Some some wasted words there, but at least he deals with it in a logical manner. And uh, I like a lot of the things he does. Some of the things could have been done better, but uh, you know, it's it's live and learn. You you start interacting with people, you learn, you start understanding patterns, you start seeing how they operate, how they act, the type of arguments that they make, how how to head their arguments off at the pass, and put them in states of confusion, which Will Duffy does several times in this debate. So I think it's good overall. I'm probably going to have to watch that second debate or that second interaction if that does happen. Oh, it, it's going to be painful. Will Duffy, he tricked me into watching that Tyler Vela interaction. Never again. I'm not going to rewatch any of those Tyler Vela interactions or any future ones. But this one um, actually provided things of interest. So much so that we got two and a half hours discussing it. So I probably useful. Uh, very interesting guest. Uh, thanks to Idol Killer, who has his uh, channel on YouTube called Idol Killer. Just uh, look that up. And the Provisionist Perspective. That is uh, uh, Drew. Drew McLeod. I was going to call him Drew McGruff. I was going to like conflate all these different hosts. No, they're good people. Uh, Warren McGrew and uh, Drew McLeod of the Clan McLeod from Highlander. I don't know if he's old enough to know that reference. I still haven't tied down his age. I don't know if he's 20s or 50s. It could it could go either way. Probably somewhere in that range. Anyways, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you had a good time. Comments or questions, put that down below. And uh, until next time.